Story 1. The relentless drumming of rain against my car's roof was a monotonous soundtrack to what was quickly becoming the worst night of my life. It was late, much too late, and the inky darkness enveloped the deserted stretch of highway like a shroud. My headlights carved a weak path through the torrential downpour, the wipers working overtime yet barely managing to clear the deluge from my windshield. It happened suddenly the unmistakable flapping sound of a flat tire. My heart sank. With a sigh, I steered the car to the shoulder, the gravel crunching under the tires jarringly loud in the quiet of the night. No cell signal. Of course, there wouldn't be any cell signal out here, miles away from the nearest town. I was utterly alone. I stepped out into the rain, the cold water instantly soaking through my clothes, chilling me to the bone. The spare tire and jack were in the trunk, and as I set about changing the tire, a prickling sense of unease washed over me. Every small sound seemed amplified a distant rustling, the splash of water from my movements, the howl of the wind. Then I heard it. Footsteps. Not the random patter of raindrops, but the deliberate, squelching sound of someone walking through the mud. I straightened up, peering into the darkness. Hello, I called out, my voice sounding small and timid against the storm. No reply came, just the continued sound of footsteps drawing nearer. Panic began to set in. I hurried with the tire, my hands clumsy and shaking. The lug nuts didn't want to come loose, and the rain made everything slippery. I cast nervous glances over my shoulder, trying to catch a glimpse of whoever was out there but saw nothing. The footsteps stopped. The sudden silence was even more terrifying than the noise had been. I held my breath, listening, waiting. A flash of lightning illuminated the landscape for a brief second, revealing nothing but the storm-lashed highway stretching emptily in both directions. I went back to the tire, my fingers numb from the cold. Finally, I got the flat tire off and the spare on. I was just tightening the last of the lug nuts when I heard the footsteps again, this time coming from the other side of the road. A cold dread settled over me. I threw the flat tire into the trunk and slammed it shut, not bothering to put away the jack properly. Jumping into the driver's seat, I locked the doors and started the engine. The car moved forward hesitantly on the new tire, and I didn't dare accelerate too much for fear of losing control on the slick road. I kept checking the rearview mirror, expecting at any moment to see a figure emerging from the gloom. But there was nothing. Only rain, darkness, and an empty road stretching behind me. The farther I drove, the more the fear began to ebb, replaced by a weary relief. I promised myself I'd stop at the next town, no matter how small, and find a motel. Anywhere would be better than the road I'd just left behind. And yet, as the miles passed and the storm continued to rage, I couldn't shake the feeling that something had been out there, watching me struggle in the rain. The memory of those footsteps, so close yet unseen, haunted me all the way home. Story 2 Rain cascaded down the glass of the bus shelter, blurring the street lights into hazy orbs of yellow. It was late, the kind of late that made every shadow sinister and every sound a threat. I huddled deeper into my coat, glancing at my watch for the umpteenth time. The last bus was significantly late, and with each passing minute, the knot of anxiety in my stomach grew tighter. The street was deserted, save for the occasional car splashing through the accumulating water on the road. I had stayed late at the office to finish a project, and now I regretted not leaving earlier or taking a cab. But budget cuts and recent personal expenses had made me more frugal than usual. Finally, the headlights of a bus appeared, cutting through the thick curtain of rain. Relief washed over me as it approached, its tires hissing on the wet asphalt. The bus pulled up with a squeal of brakes, and the doors opened with a pneumatic hiss. It was strangely empty, which was unusual for this hour, even on a stormy night. I stepped aboard, greeted by the warm, musty air inside. 
The driver was a middle-aged man with a scruffy beard and a cap pulled low over his eyes. He gave me a nod and an unsettling smile that didn't quite reach his eyes. I quickly scanned my bus card and moved to sit near the front, trying to shake off the chill from the rain. The bus lurched forward, and I watched the familiar streets pass by, blurred and distorted by the rain. I was eager to get home, to the warmth and safety of my apartment. However, as we neared my stop, I leaned forward, pressing the stop button. The bell chimed, but the bus didn't slow. Instead, it continued past my stop, the street disappearing behind us. Panic flared up inside me. Excuse me, you missed my stop, I called out to the driver. He glanced at me in the rearview mirror, that eerie smile still plastered on his face. No stops tonight, not until we reach the end of the line. His tone was final, sending a shiver down my spine. I stood up, moving towards the front. I need to get off. My stop was back there. The driver shook his head, his eyes meeting mine in the mirror again. It's better this way. Safer, with the storm and all. I didn't understand his reasoning. It was as if he wasn't even speaking to me, but to someone or something else. The bus sped on, turning off the usual route onto a darker, more secluded road. I tried to control my rising fear, my mind racing through possibilities. Was he kidnapping me? Was this some sort of mistake? As the landscape became less familiar, my desperation grew. I looked around for something, anything, that could be used as a weapon or a tool. The bus was old, the safety hammer on the glass enclosure missing, likely broken or removed long ago. Deciding I couldn't wait to find out his intentions, I rushed forward, confronting the driver directly. Let me off now, I demanded, my voice louder, more forceful. He simply shook his head again, ignoring my demands. The bus entered a wooded area, the trees looming ominously as they swayed in the storm. I knew I had to act. Waiting any longer would only take me further from any help or chance of escape. With a deep breath, I grabbed the fire extinguisher mounted near the front door. Using it as a batter, I smashed it against the door mechanism. The bus screeched to a halt, the driver finally reacting as he realized what I was attempting. But it was too late for him to stop me. I managed to force the doors open, jumping out into the muddy ditch beside the road. The rain pelted me as I ran, not looking back, not knowing if the driver was following. I sprinted through the trees, guided only by the occasional flash of lightning. After what felt like an eternity, I emerged onto a more familiar road, one that led directly into town. Exhausted, soaked, and trembling, I made my way to the nearest open convenience store, where I called the police. They arrived quickly, but when they went to check the bus route, there was no sign of the bus or the driver. It was as if the night had swallowed them whole. Shaken by the ordeal, I was left with countless questions and a deep-seated fear of taking the bus after dark. Whatever the driver's intentions had been, I was just grateful to have escaped unharmed. Story 3 The decision to rent a remote cabin for a week of solitude seemed perfect at the time. Tucked away in the dense woods of the Pacific Northwest, the cabin promised peace, quiet, and a break from the incessant buzz of city life. The day I arrived, the sky was a clear blue, and the air was crisp with the scent of pine and earth a sharp contrast to the urban smog I had left behind. The cabin was rustic, built from aged cedar that had darkened over the years. It stood alone, surrounded by an expanse of forest that stretched endlessly. Inside, it was cozy and well-furnished with a stone fireplace, a plush sofa, and a small kitchen. It was exactly what I needed to unwind and disconnect. The first couple of days were blissful. I spent my time reading, writing, and taking long walks through the woods. The serenity was palpable, only the rustle of leaves and distant calls of woodland creatures filling the silence. However, on the third evening, as the weather took a turn, 
my perfect retreat began to feel more like a scene from a thriller. Heavy clouds rolled in, casting an ominous shadow over the land, and soon rain began to fall. It started as a drizzle but quickly intensified into a downpour that drummed steadily on the roof. I settled in by the fireplace, book in hand, trying to ignore the growing storm outside. The wind howled, and the trees swayed as if in distress. As the evening darkened, the warmth of the fire and the sound of the rain created a hypnotic rhythm, lulling me into a sense of security. That was until I heard the doorknob turn. The sound was distinct, deliberate. My heart raced as I stared at the door. Slowly it creaked open. I stood up, my book falling to the floor. The doorway revealed nothing but the dark, wet night outside. No figure stood there, no one called out. Yet, unmistakably, a set of wet, muddy footprints began to appear on the wooden floor, leading from the door into the cabin. Frozen with fear, I followed the footprints with my eyes as they made their way deeper into the cabin. They stopped abruptly in the middle of the room, as if whoever or whatever had made them had vanished into thin air. I gathered my courage and cautiously approached the spot where the footprints ended. There was nothing there, no sign of anyone or anything that could have made them. I searched the cabin, checking every room and closet, but found nothing out of place. The windows were securely locked from the inside, and there was no other door. The rational part of my mind struggled to make sense of it. Could someone have entered, and then left? But how and where did they disappear? The footprints suggested a presence that had been real, at least for a moment. Sleep eluded me that night. Every creak and crack of the cabin set me on edge, my imagination conjuring up all sorts of horrors. By morning the storm had passed and the sun peeked through the clouds, casting light on the still visible footprints. I decided to photograph them, a tangible proof of the night's eerie encounter. Determined to uncover some answers, I went to the nearest town. The locals listened to my story with a mixture of concern and an unnerving familiarity. An old man at the general store finally offered an explanation after much hesitation. Years ago, he said, a woodsman had lived in my rented cabin and had vanished one stormy night, leaving behind only a series of mysterious footprints. Since then, rumors had swirled of his spirit returning whenever a storm hit, searching for something he'd lost. Whether it was true or just a piece of local folklore, the story chilled me to the bone. I returned to the cabin, packed my belongings, and left, unable to spend another night there. The tranquility I had sought was overshadowed by the haunting memory of those footprints, a reminder that sometimes solitude comes with its own companions. Story 4 I had always been an adventurer at heart, preferring the road less traveled, which is why when I found myself running late for a dinner with friends in the neighboring town, I decided to take the shortcut through the woods. The path, though less used and overgrown, was scenic and supposedly cut the drive by 10 minutes. What I didn't anticipate was the sudden change in weather that transformed my adventurous spirit into a regretful hindsight. As I drove my old jeep along the narrow, winding path, the sky darkened ominously. Within moments a heavy rain began to fall, drumming loudly against the windshield and reducing visibility to a mere few feet ahead. The dense canopy of trees hardly allowed any light, and the path became slick and treacherous. Realizing too late the folly of my decision, I decided to turn back. But as I maneuvered the vehicle to reverse course, the engine sputtered and died, refusing to start again. With my cell phone showing no signal and the rain intensifying, panic began to set in. I was stranded, alone, and increasingly anxious. With no other option, I grabbed my raincoat from the back seat, locked the jeep, and decided to head back on foot. The path, familiar in daylight, now seemed like a stranger, its twists and turns masked by the thick undergrowth and the curtain of rain. As I walked, 
The sound of the storm was punctuated by the occasional snap of twigs underfoot, my own steps a constant reminder of the isolation surrounding me. After what felt like an hour of walking through the relentless downpour, I stumbled upon an old house, its silhouette barely visible through the sheets of rain. The house looked as though it had been abandoned for decades, its wooden structure decayed and overgrown with ivy. Curiosity, mixed with a desperate need for shelter, drew me closer. The front door was ajar, creaking ominously as I pushed it open and stepped inside. The air was thick with the smell of mold and dampness. As my eyes adjusted to the dim light, I noticed photographs hanging on the walls and scattered across the floor. Moving closer, I felt a chill run down my spine. The photographs were of me. There were pictures from my daily life me at the grocery store, sitting in my office, walking my dog in the park. Some were recent, others looked older, but all were taken without my knowledge. My heart raced as I picked up photo after photo, each snapshot a violation of my privacy, each one more unnerving than the last. In the center of the room was a desk cluttered with more photographs and notes written in a frantic, scribbled hand. The notes mentioned times, dates, and activities, details of my routine, my habits, observations about my life. It was as if someone had been tracking me, studying me. The realization that I was not alone in that moment, that whoever had taken these photographs might still be nearby, struck me with terror. I rushed out of the house, back into the rain, driven by a primal urge to escape. I ran without direction, my mind clouded with fear, until I saw the lights of a car approaching on the road. Waving my arms frantically, I managed to flag down the vehicle. It was a local police patrol, out looking for any stranded motorists due to the storm. I quickly explained what had happened, and the officers, seeing my distressed state, agreed to escort me back to the house. When we arrived, the house was as I had left it, the eerie collection of my life on display. The officers were as baffled as I was, immediately calling for backup and starting an investigation. They found fingerprints and other evidence that suggested someone had indeed been living there, at least sporadically. As the investigation continued over the following weeks, it was discovered that the person who had taken the photographs was a reclusive man who had once worked with me briefly. Obsessed and unstable, he had somehow fixated on me, watching and documenting my life from the shadows. The shortcut through the woods, which had seemed like a simple time saver, had led me to a chilling discovery that shook my sense of security forever. Though the man was eventually caught and dealt with by the law, the photographs haunted me a stark reminder of how closely danger can lurk, hidden behind the facade of the mundane. Story 5 The rain started as a drizzle but quickly escalated into a deluge, as if the sky had decided to unload all its burdens at once. I had been walking home from the library, a stack of books under my arm, enjoying the cool evening air before the weather turned. The sudden rain caught me off guard, soaking through my clothes and chilling me to the bone. I needed to find shelter quickly. Up ahead, the outline of an old bridge loomed, a relic from the city's industrial past now mostly used by pedestrians and occasional cyclists. It seemed like the perfect refuge from the storm. As I approached, the sound of the rain pounding on the pavement turned into a muted roar under the bridge's wide expanse. It was darker beneath the bridge, the only light coming from a flickering street lamp on the opposite end. The air smelled of wet earth and concrete. I found a relatively dry spot and settled down to wait out the rain, my back against the cold, graffiti-covered wall. I hadn't been alone for more than a few minutes when I sensed movement on the other side of the bridge. At first I thought it might be another stranded pedestrian seeking shelter, but the shadows didn't move like someone merely avoiding the rain. There was something deliberate in their approach, something unnerving. 
A group of figures emerged from the darkness, their features obscured by hoodies in the dim light. They were talking in low, hushed tones, casting glances in my direction. I tightened my grip on my books, suddenly aware of how isolated we were, tucked away from the main road and any potential help. As they drew closer, their conversation ceased. They formed a semicircle around me, blocking any easy escape route. The leader, a tall figure with a deep voice, addressed me. Got any money, he asked, his tone casual but threatening. I shook my head, my voice barely above a whisper. No, I don't carry cash. He stepped closer, the smell of cigarette smoke clinging to his wet clothes. That's too bad, he said, scanning the books under my arm. Looks like you got something valuable, though. Why don't you hand them over? Panic surged through me, but so did a sudden, unexpected anger. They're just books, I retorted, pulling them closer. They're not worth anything to you. The group laughed, a harsh sound that echoed off the concrete. Everything's got a price, another one chimed in moving forward as if to grab the books from me. At that moment, the storm outside seemed to intensify, the wind howling through the structure of the bridge. It was as if nature itself was responding to the tension beneath the bridge. I used their momentary distraction to make a decision I couldn't outfight them, but maybe I could outrun them. With a sudden burst of adrenaline, I darted towards a narrow gap between two of the figures. They weren't expecting my sudden move, their reactions delayed just long enough for me to slip through. I heard shouts and footsteps behind me as they recovered and gave chase. Running in the heavy rain was like moving through a wall of water. My vision was blurred, my breathing labored. I clutched the books to my chest, determined not to lose them despite the absurdity of the situation. Behind me, the footsteps were getting louder, closer. Just as I felt a hand graze the back of my jacket, lights appeared ahead headlights from a car turning onto the road that ran parallel to the river. I veered toward the light, waving my free hand frantically. The car slowed, and the driver, a middle-aged woman, rolled down her window. What's going on? She yelled over the sound of the storm. Please help me, I shouted back glancing over my shoulder to see my pursuers hesitating in the light of the car. She unlocked the doors and I didn't hesitate, pulling open the passenger door and diving inside, the book still clutched against my chest. She drove off immediately, the figures under the bridge receding into the background. As we put distance between us and the bridge, my breathing began to slow, my heart still pounding fiercely. The woman glanced at me, concern evident on her face. Are you okay? Should I call the police? I nodded, managing a shaky smile. Yes, to both. Thank you. The rest of the ride was a blur as I recounted the incident to her, the adrenaline slowly ebbing from my system. By the time the police arrived, I was calm enough to give a statement, though my hands still trembled. That night, as I finally sat in the safety of my own home, I looked at the books I had risked so much to protect. They were drenched and a bit worse for wear, but they were more than just books now. They were a testament to my resilience, a reminder of the night I ran through the rain to escape the shadows under the bridge. Story 6 Rain had begun to fall softly as I laced up my hiking boots and checked my gear. Despite the weather forecast predicting a storm, my desire to escape the city's clamor for a day in the solitude of nature was too strong to ignore. I had chosen a familiar trail, one that I had walked many times before, nestled in the sprawling wilderness not far from where I lived. The trail was a mix of steep inclines and winding paths through dense forest. As I started my hike, the canopy of leaves above provided some shelter from the rain, but it wasn't long before the intensity of the storm increased and the rain began to seep through the trees, soaking my clothes and chilling me to the bone. I pressed on, 
determined to reach the summit despite the worsening weather. The sound of the rain and the rustling of the leaves created a symphony of nature, both soothing and exhilarating. However, the trail was becoming slippery, the mud clinging to my boots with each step. It was during one particularly steep part of the hike that my foot caught on a hidden root, and I lost my balance. The fall was swift and unforgiving. I tumbled down a short embankment, landing awkwardly on my leg. The pain was immediate and intense. I tried to stand, but the sharp jolt through my leg told me it was more serious than a simple sprain. I was alone, injured, and increasingly vulnerable as the daylight began to wane. Crawling to a nearby tree, I pulled myself into a sitting position, my back against the trunk. I reached for my phone, no signal. It was not uncommon in these parts of the woods but it was the worst possible scenario for me now. I wrapped my jacket tighter around myself, trying to retain some warmth as the temperature dropped along with the night. Hours passed, marked only by the relentless rain and the encroaching darkness. My attempts to shout for help were drowned out by the storm. As night fell, the forest took on a menacing quality, every shadow seeming to move, every sound a potential threat. It was then I realized I was not alone. Across from where I sat, under another tree, a pair of eyes caught the light from my flashlight. They were low to the ground, unblinking, and intensely focused on me. I kept the beam steady, trying to see what creature the eyes belonged to, but it remained just beyond the light's reach. The eyes watched me for what seemed like hours. I could neither move away due to my injury, nor did I dare to approach. My mind raced with possibilities, was it a coyote, a bear, or something worse? My heart pounded in my chest, each minute stretching out endlessly. As the rain finally began to ease, the creature moved, its form briefly visible. It was a large dog, or so it seemed in the dim light. Perhaps it was lost or worse, abandoned. Its demeanor did not suggest aggression but rather curiosity and perhaps its own form of weariness. With the storm subsiding, I took a chance. It's okay, I called softly, my voice hoarse. The dog cocked its head, considering the sound of my voice. I cautiously pulled out a granola bar from my pack, unwrapped it, and tossed a piece towards it. The dog sniffed it tentatively before gobbling it down. Encouraged, I tossed another piece this time a little closer to me. As the dog approached and ate again, I kept talking in a low, soothing voice. It seemed to calm both of us, a silent pact forming in the middle of the wilderness. Eventually, the dog came close enough for me to touch. It was wet and shivering, but it allowed me to stroke its head. We sat there together, the dog and I, waiting for dawn. When morning finally broke, the rain had stopped and the dog stood up, stretched, and gave a small wag of its tail. Using the tree for support, I managed to stand on one leg. The dog stayed by my side as I hobbled along, using a sturdy branch as a makeshift crutch. Together we made our way back down the trail. It took hours, but the dog never left my side. Rescue came later that day after a fellow hiker spotted us near the trailhead. The dog was taken to a local shelter, where it was discovered he had a microchip. His owners were overjoyed to have him back after he had escaped from their yard during the storm. As for me, the trail had given me more than a day in nature. It had given me a companion in my time of need, a reminder of the unexpected friendships that can arise in moments of adversity. Story 7 The storm had been raging for hours a relentless torrent that turned the roads into rivers and the night into an opaque curtain of water. I was driving back from a business meeting in a neighboring town, and the conditions had deteriorated so rapidly that I decided to pull off the highway at the next available exit. There, partially illuminated by a flickering neon sign, was a lone diner that promised a brief respite from the deluge. The diner, an old-fashioned establishment with a chrome facade and large windows, 
looked like it hadn't changed since the 1950s. I parked my car in the nearly empty lot and hurried inside, grateful for the shelter. The bell above the door jingled as I entered, announcing my arrival to an otherwise deserted scene. Inside, the diner was dimly lit, with a handful of booths lined up against the windows and a long counter with stools. The place was empty except for the cook, a burly man with a graying beard and a stained apron, who glanced up from the grill as I walked in. His gaze lingered a little too long, unsettling in its intensity. Evening, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Bad night to be out. He grunted in response, turning back to his work. Take any seat. What'll it be? Just coffee, thanks. And whatever's hot and ready, I added, taking a seat at the counter. The cook nodded, poured a mug of steaming coffee, and slid it across the counter to me. The warmth from the cup seeped into my hands, a small comfort against the chill that had set in from my rainy ordeal. As I sipped the bitter brew, the cook placed a plate of meatloaf and mashed potatoes in front of me. I ate mechanically, my eyes occasionally strained to the window where the rain continued to hammer against the glass. When I finished, I pulled out my wallet, but the cook shook his head. No hurry. Storm's not letting up. Roads will be flood soon. Might be best to stay put till morning. His suggestion was practical, yet something in his tone didn't sit right with me. I glanced at my watch, considering my options. It was late, and driving back in the storm seemed risky, but the thought of staying in this isolated diner with this man made me uneasy. Thanks, but I should try to get home, I said, standing up to leave. As I headed towards the door, I felt his gaze on my back. The bridge out of town's probably flooded already, he called after me. You won't make it far. I paused, uncertainty creeping in. Deciding to check the condition of my car first, I thanked him and stepped outside. The rain had lessened somewhat but was still heavy. As I approached my car, I noticed one of the tires looked flat. Closer inspection revealed a puncture, clean and precise as if made by a knife. A chill ran down my spine as I realized the implication. Rushing back inside, I confronted the cook. Did you do something to my car? His expression was unreadable. You really ought to stay, friend. It's not safe out there. This time there was a hint of a threat in his tone. My heart raced as I backed away, realizing that I needed a plan. Going back to the road on foot wasn't an option in this storm. Okay, I'll stay, I said, trying to sound resigned. Got a phone I can use to call home, at least. He nodded towards a phone behind the counter. As I dialed a number, I silently thanked the heavens for the lock screen I had glimpsed on my phone earlier and alert about local shelters open due to the storm. I spoke briefly, pretending to reassure someone at home, then hung up. Turning to the cook, I said, my family's going to check in on me. They know I'm here. His expression changed slightly, a flicker of annoyance or perhaps caution. Rooms out back if you want to rest, he said, pointing to a corridor that led away from the diner. I agreed, moving to the indicated room but making sure to wedge a chair under the doorknob once inside. I didn't sleep that night, listening instead for any sounds in the diner. At first light, I used the room's window to escape, slipping out and making my way to the highway on foot. It wasn't long before I flagged down a passing patrol car and explained my situation. The officers were familiar with the diner and its owner, who had a history of troubling incidents with stranded travelers. I learned a valuable lesson that night about the perils that can lurk in unsuspecting places, and the importance of trusting one's instincts when something doesn't feel right. Story 8 It was a stormy night, the kind that seemed to shake the very foundations of my old house with its fierce wind and relentless rain. 
I was nestled in the living room, wrapped in a blanket, a book forgotten on my lap as I watched the trees outside bend under the onslaught of the storm. Suddenly a loud knock echoed through the house, startling me from my reverie. I hesitated, the unexpected sound unnerving in its urgency. Another series of knocks followed, more insistent this time. I placed my book aside and stood, apprehension tightening my chest as I approached the front door. Peering through the peephole, I saw a woman. She was soaked to the skin, her hair plastered to her face, clothes clinging to her trembling form. I opened the door a crack, the wind howling into the house as she looked up, her eyes wide with a mix of fear and relief. Please, can I use your phone? There's been an accident, she stammered, her voice barely audible over the storm. Reluctantly, I opened the door wider and let her in. She hurried past me, leaving a trail of wet footprints on the wooden floor. I guided her to the living room, pointing to the phone on the end table. The phone's here. Do you need me to call an ambulance? No, I need to make the call myself. It's... it's complicated, she replied, her voice trembling as she dialed a number hastily. As she spoke into the phone, her tone shifted. She spoke quickly, her words a stream of what seemed like code phrases and numbers that made little sense. Yes, the storm is broken. Proceed with second sequence at dawn, she said, her voice now steady and assertive. Confused and increasingly alarmed, I tried to ask who she was talking to, but she ignored my questions, her attention fixed on the conversation. When she finally hung up, the silence that followed was heavy, charged with my unanswered questions. Who were you talking to, I asked, my voice firm. What's going on? She turned to me, her expression hardening. I'm sorry, I can't tell you that. Just know that you've helped more than you realize, she said cryptically. Before I could respond, she walked back to the door, pausing to look back at me. Forget this happened. It's safer that way. And then she was gone, disappearing into the storm as suddenly as she had appeared. I rushed to the window, watching her figure dissolve into the rain-drenched night, a sense of unease settling over me. What had I just been a part of? Sleep eluded me that night as I replayed the events over and over in my head. By morning the storm had cleared, but the mystery of the previous night lingered. I called the police reporting the incident, but without more to go on, there was little they could do. Days turned into weeks, and life slowly returned to normal, or as normal as it could get after such an encounter but I couldn't shake the feeling that something significant had happened, something that might yet have consequences. Several months later, the incident was unexpectedly brought back to my attention. I was watching the news when a story came up about a series of coordinated actions by a secretive organization, actions that had apparently been triggered by code phrases passed through unsuspecting intermediaries. The details were vague, but the implications were clear. The night of the storm, the woman who had come to my door had been part of something much larger, something that had now come to light in a dramatic way. I sat back, stunned. I had been an unwitting participant in a chain of events that had altered the course of something important. The realization was both terrifying and awe-inspiring. From then on, every knock on the door brought a surge of adrenaline a reminder of that night and the mysterious woman who had briefly entered my life. I wondered about her, who she really was, and the cause she had been so deeply involved in. The storm had passed, but the echoes of that knock continued to resonate, a haunting melody that played on in the quiet moments of my life. Story 9 Where is she? The sky was a dark slate gray, the clouds heavy with unspent rain as I left work. The forecast had warned of a severe storm, but I hadn't anticipated the rapidity with which it would unfold. By the time I reached the main road, the heavens had opened, and water was already beginning to pool on the streets. 
driving became a precarious endeavor as the floodwaters rose, inching up the side of my tires. Every route I attempted was blocked, either by fallen debris or accumulating water. My car, though reliable under normal circumstances, was ill-equipped for these conditions. Eventually, the engine sputtered and died, leaving me stranded in an ever-deepening waterlogged grave. With no other options, I abandoned my vehicle, wading through the rising waters. The rain pounded on me, each drop a cold sting against my skin. My usual calm demeanor gave way to a rising panic as I realized the seriousness of my situation alone and vulnerable in the flooding streets. I pressed on, determined to make it to higher ground. The water was relentless, swarming around my legs, tugging at me with each step. As I navigated through the murky flood, an eerie feeling settled over me. The streetlights flickered, casting ghostly shadows that danced just beyond my field of vision. The usual sounds of the city were muffled by the rush of the storm, replaced by the ominous gurgle of swirling water. Then, I felt it a brush against my leg under the water. I froze, my heart pounding. It could have been debris, I reasoned, or perhaps the current shifting. But it happened again, more insistently this time like a caress. I looked down into the dark water but saw nothing that could explain the sensation. Moving faster now, spurred by fear, I kept my eyes fixed on the faint lights of a nearby building that promised sanctuary. The sensation returned, a definite tug against my ankle. Panic surged through me, my mind racing with images of what might be lurking beneath the water's surface. My pace quickened to a jog, my breath short and sharp. The building was close now, a mere fifty yards away, but it felt like miles. As I made a final push towards safety, the water around me erupted into a whirl of movement. I screamed, stumbling forward as a wave of water pushed against me. Regaining my balance, I glanced back, half expecting to see some creature from the deep. But there was only the churning, chaotic flood. Shaking, I continued forward, finally reaching the steps of the building. I clambered up, collapsing at the top as I looked back at the watery expanse I had crossed. I sat there, shivering and soaked to the bone, until the storm began to abate. The flood waters slowly receded, revealing the havoc left in their wake. Cars were strewn haphazardly along the street and debris was piled against the sides of buildings. The city, my city, looked like a battleground after a relentless siege. As dawn broke, emergency services began to appear, aiding those who were stranded and assessing the damage. I joined the throngs of people emerging from their shelters, each of us sharing stories of the night's horrors. Later, as I walked back to where I had left my car, I passed by the spot where I had felt the mysterious tugs in the water. In daylight, it was just a regular street, nothing to suggest the terror of the night before. But there, tangled in a smashed street sign, was a large piece of cloth, perhaps from a curtain or a piece of clothing. The realization dawned on me that it wasn't some creature of the deep that had brushed against me, it was the remnants of someone's home, perhaps pulled along by the current. The flood had not just been a natural disaster, it had been a profoundly personal catastrophe for many. The experience left a deep impression on me. The fear of the unknown, the struggle for survival, and the community's resilience in the face of disaster were all lessons in the raw power of nature and human endurance. And while the city would rebuild, the memories of that night would linger a reminder of our vulnerability in the face of nature's wrath. Story 10 The sky was an ominous shade of gray as I pulled into the parking lot of the Lonesome Pine Motel. It was the kind of place that seemed to cling to the fringes of the highway forgotten by time and bypassed by most travelers for more welcoming accommodations. But with the storm intensifying and night falling, my options were limited. The motel's neon sign flickered sporadically, 
casting a ghostly glow that barely illuminated the gravel lot. Rain pounded on my windshield, a relentless drumbeat that hastened my steps to the shelter of the lobby. The interior was dimly lit and smelled of mildew and old smoke. Behind the counter, a disinterested clerk barely looked up from his magazine as I approached. Room for one, I said, my voice echoing slightly in the quiet. He nodded, handed me a key with a chip number seven painted on it, and pointed to a corridor that veered off to the left. End of the hall, he muttered. I thanked him and headed to my room, my shoes squeaking on the linoleum. The corridor was lined with doors, each one identical to the next, except for the numbers that marked them. When I reached room 7, I noticed that the door directly opposite room 8 was not only closed but had a yellow caution tape across it and a sign that read condemned. Curiosity peaked. I peered at the door, wondering about the story behind its sealed fate. But the fatigue from the road tugged at me, and I turned my attention to my own room, unlocking it and stepping inside. The room was as lackluster as the exterior of the motel, a bed with a lumpy mattress, a TV that looked like a relic from the 90s, and a threadbare carpet that had seen better days. The only window in the room offered a view of the storm outside, rain streaking down the glass in constant rivulets. Exhausted, I decided to call it a night. But as I settled into bed, a noise caught my attention. It was a soft creaking sound, rhythmic and persistent. It seemed to be coming from the direction of room 8, the condemned room across the hall. At first I told myself it was just the building settling, or perhaps the wind finding its way through some crevice I couldn't see. But the sound continued, growing more pronounced a clear indication of a door being repeatedly opened and closed. Curiosity overcame my better judgment, and I found myself standing outside room 8, listening. The noise was definitely coming from inside. I pressed my ear to the door, and the creaking grew louder, more deliberate. Heart racing, I debated what to do. The rational part of me screamed to leave it alone, to return to my room and forget about the noises. But then, the door to room 8 moved slightly, as if caught by a draft. Gathering my courage, I pushed against the door. To my surprise, it swung open easily, the caution tape offering little resistance. The room was shrouded in darkness, the only light coming from the hallway behind me. It was empty, devoid of furniture, except for a single chair in the center of the room. The floor around the chair was worn. The carpet faded in a circular pattern that suggested the chair had been there for some time. As I stepped closer, the air grew inexplicably colder, and the door swung shut behind me with a sharp snap. Panicking, I turned to open it but found it wouldn't budge. The creaking sound started again, louder now, and I realized with horror that it was coming from the chair, which began to rock back and forth of its own accord. I shouted, pounding on the door, my calls for help drowned out by the storm raging outside. Just as I felt a scream rise in my throat, the door suddenly opened, revealing the bored clerk standing in the hallway, flashlight in hand. Thought I heard something, he said, looking past me into the room. This place gets to you after a while. Storms especially seem to wake it up. Too shaken to respond, I followed him back to my room my glance back at room 8 showing only darkness in the still swaying chair. I didn't sleep that night, nor did I stay for the daylight. Leaving before dawn, I drove away from the lonesome pine motel, the image of the rocking chair etched into my mind, a chilling reminder of the night the condemned room decided to stir. Story 11 The day had been fraught with a kind of heavy, oppressive rain that seemed to wash the color out of the world, turning everything into a monochrome blur of grays and deep shadows. I had been on the road since early morning, my journey taking me farther from the city and deeper into the countryside where the old ways still lingered like whispers of a forgotten conversation. 
As the hours passed, the storm intensified, the raindrops hammering against the windshield with relentless fury. Visibility dwindled to a mere few feet ahead, forcing me to reduce my speed to a crawl. It was during this slow progression through the storm-swept landscape that I noticed the silhouette of an old building looming ominously against the stormy sky. With no intention of continuing in such hazardous conditions, I decided to pull over. The structure, upon closer inspection, revealed itself to be an abandoned schoolhouse, its once proud architecture now succumbing to the relentless advance of decay and neglect. The paint was peeled, windows boarded up, and the front door slightly ajar, swaying gently in the wind as if beckoning me inside. Curiosity, mixed with a reasonable desire to wait out the storm, led me through the creaking door into the dimly lit interior. My flashlight pierced the darkness, revealing faded walls lined with old portraits of classes long since graduated. The air was thick with the musty smell of mold and old books, creating an almost palpable presence of the past. Moving deeper into the schoolhouse, I found the main classroom. Desks were arranged in neat rows, each one an island of memories under a thick layer of dust. At the front of the room, a large chalkboard dominated the wall. Surprisingly, it bore remnants of lessons, multiplication tables, and fragments of history, the chalk lines eerily fresh, as if written only recently. As I approached the chalkboard to inspect it more closely, a chill ran down my spine. The sound of rain pattering against the roof melded with another sound faint, almost imperceptible at first, the sound of children's laughter. It echoed through the halls a ghostly remnant of joy frozen in time. My heart raced as I spun around, the beam of my flashlight darting across the room to catch a glimpse of anyone else who might be there. But there was only emptiness, the desk sitting unoccupied, silent witnesses to the years gone by. Determined to find a rational explanation, I explored the rest of the schoolhouse. Each room offered more of the same abandoned, frozen in a moment of time, with personal items and old textbooks scattered about as if the children had only just left. Yet the laughter continued, sometimes behind me, sometimes from above, always just out of sight, playing tricks with my mind. The storm outside seemed to grow more fierce, the winds howling as if angered by my intrusion into this forgotten place. I found my way back to the main classroom, deciding it was safer to stay where I entered. As the hours ticked by, the laughter grew more distant, replaced by the steady leak of water dripping from the ceiling into puddles on the wooden floor. Night fell, and with it, an oppressive silence descended upon the schoolhouse. The storm had moved on, leaving behind a heavy stillness. It was then, in the deep shadows of the night, that I felt the undeniable sensation of being watched. The air grew colder, and each creak and groan of the old building seemed like a whispered secret. Finally, when the first light of dawn began to seep through the boarded windows, I gathered my courage and my belongings to leave. As I stepped out into the fresh morning air, the door of the schoolhouse swung shut behind me with a definitive thud, as if closing the chapter on an unspoken story. As I drove away, the image of the chalkboard haunted me, the lessons written in chalk a stark reminder of the lives that had once filled the old schoolhouse. The laughter, though perhaps a trick of the wind and my rattled nerves, lingered in my mind a haunting melody that echoed through the corridors of my thoughts long after the schoolhouse had disappeared from my rearview mirror. Story 12 Rain hammered down relentlessly, turning the evening into a cascade of opaque curtains that blurred the world into wet shadows. That night, my dog Max had slipped through the open door, unseen in the distraction of a loud movie and the roar of the storm outside. Realizing he was missing, panic immediately set in Max was more than a pet. He was family. 
Grabbing a flashlight and pulling on a ring coat, I stepped into the tempest. The beam of my light cut a narrow path through the darkness, the only sound the relentless drumming of rain on the ground and the distant rumble of thunder. My heart raced as I called out his name, each shout muffled by the storm's fury. I wandered through the neighborhood, my voice growing hoarse, hope dwindling with each passing minute. Then, faintly, almost lost beneath the storm's howl, I heard barking. It was Max. The sound energized my tired limbs, pushing me onward through the soaked streets. The barking led me to the outskirts of the neighborhood where the houses gave way to fields, and then to a dilapidated barn that stood alone, its structure an eerie silhouette against the stormy backdrop. The barn, abandoned for years, loomed ominously, its roof partially collapsed, walls leaning as if they might succumb to the wind at any moment. Max's barks grew louder as I approached, pushing against the swollen wooden door. I managed to pry it open just enough to slip inside. My flashlight flickered as I scanned the interior, revealing a chaotic mess of hay, broken tools, and the remnants of farm equipment long since used. There in the corner was Max. His fur was matted and wet, his tail wagging weakly as he saw me. But his attention was focused intensely on a small wooden trapdoor partially hidden beneath a pile of rotting hay. He barked at it, then at me, clearly agitated. Curiosity overcame my relief at finding Max, and I approached the trap door. Pulling it open revealed a set of narrow, rickety stairs leading down into pitch black darkness. The air that rose from the depths was cool and musty, filled with the scent of earth and something less identifiable, something unsettling. I hesitated torn between the desire to flee this creepy place and the need to understand why Max was so distressed. Decision made, I descended carefully, the old steps creaking ominously under my weight. At the bottom, my flashlight illuminated a small, dirt-floored basement, empty except for the remnants of what looked like very old, very forgotten storage items covered in dust and cobwebs. Moving the light around, I froze when the beam fell upon the far corner. There, half buried under the dirt, were bones. Animal bones by the look of them, but not just one or two, there were dozens, forming a mikhail that had clearly been there for many years. The realization of what this place had been a dumping ground for animals, possibly the victims of whatever predator once roamed these parts, sent a chill through me. Max whined, nudging my hand with his nose, pulling me back to the present. I needed to get out, to take Max and leave this sinister place behind. We ascended the stairs, the sound of the storm still raging outside a grim minder that we weren't yet safe. Emerging from the barn, I took one last look at the trap door, shivering at the thought of what lay beneath. The walk back home was quick, powered by adrenaline. Once inside, I locked the doors and dried Max off, checking him for any injuries. Thankfully, he was unharmed, if a little shaken. I made a mental note to call the authorities in the morning about the barn such a place needed to be investigated for the safety of the community. Sitting by the fire with Max curled up beside me, I couldn't shake the eerie feeling that clung to me like the cold. The night's events had revealed a dark secret hidden beneath the surface of our seemingly peaceful town. The storm outside continued, but its fury was now a faint echo compared to the turmoil inside my thoughts. As the hours passed and the storm finally began to abate, I realized that some things, once unearthed, leave a mark that no amount of rain can wash away. But after the unsettling discovery at the barn, I lay awake, unable to shake the images from my mind. The pile of bones so carelessly discarded spoke of untold stories hidden in the shadows of our quiet town. I found myself pondering the lives those animals might have led, the fear and pain they experienced in their final moments. It was a grim reminder that beneath the facade of any place, secrets lurk, some darker than others. As dawn approached, 
the storm subsided into a gentle drizzle, its rage spent. The first light of morning filtered through the curtains, casting a pale glow that seemed to wash away some of the night's horror. But the memory of what I had seen was indelible, etched into my consciousness like the grooves on a record. Later that morning as I sipped my coffee, the phone call to the sheriff seemed to ring out in the quiet of the house, too loud in its urgency. I reported everything, my voice steady despite the turmoil inside. The sheriff promised a swift investigation, his tone serious, acknowledging the gravity of the discovery. Hanging up, I felt a small relief, but it was overshadowed by a lingering sense of vigilance. Max sensed my unease and stayed close, his presence a comforting reminder of normalcy in a world that had suddenly shown its hidden, sinister layers. Story 13 The rain had started as a drizzle earlier in the day, light and almost playful. But as night approached, it transformed into a torrential downpour, aggressive and unrelenting. I had spent the evening at a friend's house in the countryside, enjoying a respite from the hustle of city life. It was supposed to be a simple visit, a dinner, and a long conversation about life's trivial and profound matters. However, as I left to drive back home, I found the weather less accommodating. Navigating through the country roads, the visibility was poor, the headlights of my car barely cutting through the heavy rain. I should have taken the main road back to the city, but a misguided attempt to avoid what I assumed would be worse weather had me turning down a narrow, less traveled path. The muddy road was bordered by dense foliage, trees arching overhead, their branches groaning under the weight of the rain. The further I drove, the more alien the path seemed. It wasn't a road I remembered, and a creeping unease settled in the pit of my stomach. I decided it would be best to turn around and head back to the main road. As I looked for a place to maneuver my car, the headlights flashed across something unsettling a rusty, old truck parked perpendicular across the road, blocking the way. There was no sign of the driver, and the truck looked abandoned, covered in a thick layer of mud and leaves, as if it had been there for seasons. With no way forward, I had no choice but to continue along the strange path, hoping it would loop back to a more familiar road, or at least offer a spot wide enough to turn around. As I drove, the rain seemed to speak, tapping out erratic rhythms on the roof of the car, mixing with the sound of static from the radio, which had lost signal when I deviated from my intended route. The road narrowed further, the trees now so close their branches scraped against the car's windows. The darkness and isolation were oppressive, the only light provided by the occasional flash of lightning that seemed to strike uncomfortably close. Each flash illuminated the road in stark white light, casting deep shadows that seemed to move as soon as they appeared. After what felt like an eternity, the road opened into a small clearing where the remains of what looked like an old farm could be seen. There was enough space here to turn the car around. Just as I was maneuvering the vehicle, the headlights swept across another unsettling sight of figure standing at the edge of the clearing, just beyond the reach of the light. Frozen, I squinted through the rain-soaked window, trying to discern if what I saw was real. The figure stood motionless, its features obscured by the darkness. My heart raced, and the sound of the rain suddenly felt deafening. I didn't dare to exit the car instead. I locked the doors and stared, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. After a tense minute, the figure slowly moved, its movements deliberate, almost as if aware of my terror. It walked towards the car, and I could see now that it was a man, middle-aged, his clothes drenched, clinging to his body, and his face gaunt, with deep-set eyes that seemed to reflect the storm's fury. He stopped a few feet away from the car, just outside the range of the headlights and gestured with his hand, beckoning me to lower the window. Reluctantly I obeyed, the electric hum of the window breaking the silence as it descended. We need help, he shouted over the roar of the rain. His voice was rough, 
almost as ragged as his appearance. I managed to nod, my voice caught in my throat. Rhodes blocked a mile down by a landslide. You won't get through tonight, he said, pointing back the way I had come. Panic surged through me at the thought of being stuck, but then the man pointed to the dilapidated farmhouse. There's shelter there, safe to wait out the storm. I can guide you, he offered. Every instinct screamed that going with this stranger was a bad idea, yet the storm, the isolation, and the blocked roads left me with little choice. I agreed hesitantly, and he nodded, motioning for me to follow him to the house. The interior of the farmhouse was as grim as its exterior, the rooms bare and filled with the musty scent of decay. The man lit a candle, the flickering light casting eerie shadows on the walls. He introduced himself as Harold, a caretaker of sorts, watching over the property which had been long abandoned. As the hours passed, Harold shared stories of the farmhouse, its history interwoven with the land and the community that once thrived here. His tales were a mixture of mundane farm life and the occasional tragedy that seemed inevitable in such a secluded place. Eventually, the conversation waned and exhaustion overtook my initial apprehension. I found an old couch in what had once been the living room and tried to rest, the storm still raging outside. Morning came, gray and wet, but calmer. I thanked Harold, who had disappeared as mysteriously as he had appeared. The road was indeed blocked as he had said, and I had to wait for a crew to clear the path. As I finally drove away, the sun broke through the clouds, casting light on the path that had seemed so menacing the night before. The experience had been surreal, almost dreamlike, but the relief of returning to familiar roads and the buzz of the city was palpable. Yet, the memory of that night, of Harold and the storm, remained etched in my mind, a stark reminder of the unexpected turns life can take and the hidden depths of the places we think we know. Story 14 The night was oppressive, with thick, heavy rain that seemed to push down from the sky with tangible weight, muffling the world into silence except for the steady patter of water on concrete. I had always enjoyed storms, finding a strange comfort in the chaos of nature. But tonight the storm felt different, unsettling. As I prepared for bed, I glanced out of the window to watch the rain. That's when I noticed him for the first time a figure, cloaked in a dark hood, standing across the street under the faint glow of a flickering street light. He seemed to be looking directly at my apartment, his posture rigid and unyielding against the storm. I drew the curtains quickly, a shiver running down my spine. The rational part of me argued that it was just someone caught in bad weather, perhaps waiting for someone or lost. But something about the way he stood so still, so focused, unsettled me deeply. Trying to shake off my unease, I went to bed, but sleep proved elusive. My mind kept drifting back to the figure in the rain. After tossing and turning for what felt like hours, I got up and peered through the curtains. He was still there, in the same position, now seemingly staring directly at my window. I recoiled as if struck, the curtain falling back into place. Unable to settle, I turned on every light in the apartment. A childish attempt to banish the shadows where fear thrived. Each creak and groan of the building, each howl of the wind seemed amplified, fueling my growing dread. As the storm intensified, the power flickered and then went out, plunging the apartment into darkness. The sound of the rain became deafening in the absence of all other noise. Fumbling for my phone, I used it as a makeshift torch, the weak light trembling in my shaking hand. The darkness felt thick, almost suffocating. I made my way to the living room, intending to check the windows once more. That's when I heard it the faintest sound, a creak that didn't belong slow and deliberate. It was the sound of my front door, slowly opening. My heart leapt into my throat, and panic seized me. 
I froze, every instinct screaming that I was no longer alone. In the dim light of my phone, I could just make out a shadow moving across the floor's slow, steady intrusion. I thought of calling out, demanding to know who was there, but fear clamped my mouth shut. Instead, I backed away slowly, trying to move silently to the kitchen where I knew there were knives, anything that could serve as a weapon. The shadow moved again, closer this time. It was then that I noticed something the shadow didn't match the form of a man it was too misshapen, too large. As it moved, it seemed less like a person and more like... something else. My mind raced, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. Was it a trick of the light, my imagination fueled by fear? Or was there something truly unexplainable standing in my living room? The shadow paused and I held my breath praying it hadn't noticed my movement. But it did. It turned, and what I saw next will forever haunt me. There wasn't one form, but multiple, as if a group of figures had merged into one amorphous mass, shifting and pulsating as if breathing. I didn't wait to see more. Adrenaline coursed through my veins, and I ran. I ran to the kitchen, grabbed the first knife I could find, and then to my bedroom, locking the door behind me. I pushed the dresser against the door, barricading myself in. Outside, the storm continued to rage, a symphony of thunder and wind that seemed to mirror the chaos inside me. Time lost meaning as I sat there, back against the wall, knife in hand, staring at the door as if I could will it to hold against whatever was outside. Eventually, the sun began to rise, the storm abating with the coming light. The power returned, and with it, a semblance of normalcy. Cautiously, I moved the dresser and opened the door. There was nothing there. The living room was empty, everything as I had left it, except for the wet footprints on the floor, leading from the front door to the middle of the room and then, nothing. I reported the incident to the police, but there was little they could do. No sign of forced entry. No evidence of anyone being there except my own account. The footprints could have been mine. They said perhaps I had forgotten closing the door properly. But I know what I saw. I know the fear wasn't just a product of my imagination. Since that night I've never felt alone in my apartment. Sometimes when the rain falls heavy against the windows, I swear I can feel eyes on me, watching, waiting. The figure never appeared under the streetlight again, but the memory of that night lingers, a constant reminder that not all storms come from the sky. Some, perhaps, stir from places we can neither see nor understand, their motives as obscure as the shadows they cast in our lives. Story 15 It was a rainy evening and the twilight dimmed earlier than usual, shrouded by dense clouds. I was driving home from work, taking the scenic route along the coastal road to avoid the gridlock downtown. The wipers struggled against the downpour, smearing the headlights of oncoming cars into ghostly halos on my windshield. As I rounded a bend, I spotted a figure on the shoulder of the road. A man drenched from head to toe, his thumb outstretched in the universal sign of a hitchhiker seeking refuge from the storm. Normally I wouldn't stop everyone knows not to pick up strangers. But something about his forlorn posture, the way he seemed so small against the vast, angry ocean behind him, stirred a sense of empathy in me. I pulled over and he wasted no time getting in, sliding into the passenger seat with a grateful nod. Thanks for stopping, he said, his voice rough, almost as if he'd been shouting over the roar of the storm all night. I'm Tom. Where are you headed, I asked as we resumed the drive. Just up the road a few miles, Tom replied, pointing vaguely forward, near the old lighthouse. We drove in silence for a few moments, the only sound the relentless tapping of rain on the car roof. Tom seemed preoccupied, gazing out the window as if lost in thought. To break the silence, I tried to make small talk. Not a great night to be out, I commented. 
No, it isn't, he agreed, turning his gaze back inside the car. But it's better than where I was. Something in his tone caught my attention, a hint of something dark lurking beneath the surface. I glanced at him, trying to read his expression in the dim light from the dashboard. You know this area well, I ventured. Tom smiled, a thin, almost wistful smile. I grew up around here. Know every house, every hidden path down to the beach, every story that's ever been told about the old lighthouse. His knowledge of the local area was impressive. He began to point out landmarks as we drove, recounting tales of shipwrecks and rescues, of loves lost and found by the rugged coastline. But his story soon took a darker turn. You see that house Tom pointed to a shadowy figure barely visible through the sheets of rain. I've been inside that one. Lovely family, four bedrooms, nice fireplace. They should really lock their back door though. A chill ran down my spine, his words sinking in. You've been inside, why? Tom turned to look at me, his eyes gleaming strangely in the light from the approaching headlights. Oh, I've been inside most of these homes around here. People are very trusting in small towns. They leave windows open, doors unlocked. His voice trailed off, leaving an ominous silence. I felt a growing unease, wondering who I had just let into my car. The atmosphere had shifted palpably and now I was keenly aware of every remote stretch of road that lay between us and the next town. As we approached the lighthouse, Tom spoke up again. Just drop me off here. I can walk the rest of the way. I slowed the car, stopping near a path that led up to the lighthouse. Tom opened the door but paused before getting out. You know, you really should be more careful about who you pick up, he said, a grave seriousness replacing the earlier casual tone. Not everyone has good intentions. With that, he stepped out into the rain and disappeared quickly up the path swallowed by the night and the storm. I drove away, my heart racing, replaying our conversation in my head. His parting words echoed ominously, a warning or perhaps a threat. When I got home, I double-checked all the locks on my doors and windows, a habit I had grown lax about. I lay in bed listening to the storm, thinking about Tom about the ease with which he spoke of entering other people's homes. It struck me then just how vulnerable we all are, how our sense of community and trust can be exploited by those who know how to navigate these emotional landscapes. The next day I called a friend who worked at the local police station. I asked casually if there had been any reports of break-ins or suspicious activities around the area. To my relief, there were none. Perhaps Tom had just been spinning tales to pass the time or to unsettle me. Either way, I couldn't shake the disquiet his words had instilled in me. Over the following weeks, I avoided the coastal road taking the longer, more populated route instead. The incident faded gradually from my mind, filed away as just another strange story in a life full of odd encounters. But sometimes on stormy nights I'd find myself peering out into the darkness, half expecting to see Tom's figure standing by the roadside, watching, waiting, as enigmatic and unpredictable as the sea itself. Story 16 It was a grey, overcast day with a steady rain falling, the kind that soaks through clothes in minutes and chills to the bone. I was taking my usual walk through the park, umbrella in hand, trying to clear my head from the week's worries. The park was nearly empty, a rare sight given its usual bustle. Only a few dedicated joggers and dog walkers braved the weather. As I approached the bridge over the creek, something on the path caught my eye a phone, partially submerged in a puddle, raindrops drumming steadily on its screen. Curious, I picked it up shaking off the water. Surprisingly, it was still on, displaying a series of missed calls and text messages, all from the same number labeled Mom. Feeling a responsibility to return it to its owner, 
I tucked the phone into my jacket pocket and continued my walk, planning to dry it out and charge it at home. Once dry, I powered it back up. The phone unlocked with a simple swipe, no security code, a stark reminder of how often people overlook basic privacy precautions. The background was a generic picture of the park, taken in spring when the flowers were in bloom. I began to scroll through the contacts, looking for a home or another number that might lead to a quick return. However, what I found next halted my search. The photo gallery icon caught my attention, and curiosity got the better of me. Opening it I expected pictures of friends, family outings, or vacation snaps, but instead I found something far more unsettling. The first few photos were normal enough pictures of the park, a couple of selfies, a shot of a cat, but as I continued to swipe, the images grew increasingly disturbing. There were dozens of photos taken at night, the scenes all eerily familiar. They were of my apartment building, taken from various angles in the surrounding bushes and trees. Each photo was closer than the last, zooming in on windows and doors. The most recent pictures were of my own window, the curtains part way open, revealing the interior. A chill ran down my spine as the implication of these photos sank in. Someone had been watching me, documenting my home for who knows how long. The phone slipped from my hands, landing softly on the couch beside me. My mind raced, piecing together the last few weeks' odd occurrences shadows at the window late at night, the feeling of being watched, unexplained noises outside my apartment. I knew I had to act quickly. Picking up the phone, I dialed the most recent contact mom and explained the situation to the woman who answered. Her reaction was one of shock and confusion. She confirmed the phone belonged to her son, whom she described as troubled, and recently released from a stint in a mental health facility. She apologized profusely, promising to handle the situation and assured me she would get her son the help he needed. I agreed to meet her at a public place to return the phone insisting we meet in the busy coffee shop downtown. The meeting was brief. She was an older woman, her face lined with worry. She thanked me for the phone, her hands trembling as she took it. Her eyes were filled with tears as she spoke of her son's struggles, her hopelessness palpable. We parted with her promising to ensure her son couldn't continue his surveillance. The days following were tense. I invested in better curtains and added extra locks to my doors. I reported the incident to the police, but without direct threats or evidence of physical stalking, there was little they could do. Sleep was elusive. Every sound seemed magnified, every shadow a potential threat. I kept replaying the discovery of the phone, wondering how long the watching had gone on before I'd interrupted it. The park, once a refuge, now felt like a scene from a crime. As weeks turned into months, the fear gradually began to subside. The woman occasionally sent me messages updating me on her son's progress in a new treatment program, which helped to reassure me. Life returned to a semblance of normalcy, but the incident left a permanent mark on my perception of privacy and safety. Eventually I found solace in the support of friends and a newfound vigilance that ensured my personal security. The park regained its charm as the seasons changed, the flowers blooming once again under the sun's warmth, a stark contrast to the dark, rainy day when a lost phone had disrupted my life. This ordeal taught me about the fragile line between public and private life, and how quickly one can become vulnerable. It was a profound reminder of the interconnectedness of our actions and the unseen burdens others carry, often just one lost item away from being revealed. Story 17 The night was unusually dark, the street lights struggling against the heavy rain that blurred the edges of the world into a wet canvas. I had decided to go for a jog, a habit I clung to regardless of weather, believing the harder the conditions, the stronger my resolve. Tonight though, as I laced up my sneakers and stepped out into the storm, 
I felt a twinge of unease and instinctual whisper telling me maybe this wasn't such a good idea. I started my run at a steady pace, the sound of my footsteps and the rhythmic splashing of puddles sinking with the beat of the rain. The usual paths were deserted, the fair-weather joggers deterred by the downpour. I was alone, or so I thought. About fifteen minutes into my route, a slow-moving car turned onto the street. It was an old sedan, battered and nondescript, its headlights dim in the heavy rain. At first I paid it little mind, focusing on my pace and breathing. But the car kept pace with me, crawling along the road at my running speed. A chill ran down my spine, the discomforting realization that I was being followed settling in as I turned down another street, hoping to lose the vehicle. The car followed, confirming my fears. Panic began to set in, my heart racing not from the exertion but from fear. I increased my speed, sprinting now, water and sweat mingling on my brow. The car matched my pace, the engine's low growl a constant presence just behind me. Desperation clawed at my thoughts as I approached a more populated part of town. The streets were still mostly empty, the rain a barrier keeping people indoors. But up ahead I saw the warm glow of a cafe. The windows steamed from the heat inside, silhouettes of people visible through the glass. With the last of my energy, I sprinted towards the cafe, bursting through the door to a chorus of surprised looks. Panting, drenched and trembling, I managed to explain that someone was following me. The few patrons inside rallied to my aid, peering out the windows at the car, which had stopped a short distance away. The driver of the sedan, realizing I wasn't alone anymore, finally drove off, the red tail lights disappearing into the night. The cafe's manager called the police, and I waited, my body starting to shake from the adrenaline crash. The police arrived quickly, taking my statement and commending me for seeking help. They promised to patrol the area, looking for the car, but without a license plate or a better description of the vehicle, there was little hope of finding the driver. Grateful for the warmth and safety of the cafe, I called a friend to pick me up not willing to risk another encounter on the streets. As I waited, the cafe's patrons shared their own stories of close calls and the importance of being aware of one's surroundings. Their words meant to comfort only served to heighten my awareness of how vulnerable I had been. When my friend arrived, I thanked the people in the cafe, their kindness a small light in the night's darkness. The drive home was quiet, my thoughts loud in the silence. Once home, I double-checked all the locks, the night's fear still clinging to me like the damp of my clothes. Sleep was elusive that night. Every sound seemed magnified, every shadow suspect. The ordeal replayed in my mind, each detail sharp and vivid. The next day, I bought pepper spray, a small but significant means of regaining control over my safety. The incident also prompted a change in my routine. I joined a local running group, abandoning my solitary jogs for the safety of numbers. The group, a mix of seasoned and novice runners, welcomed me with open arms, their camaraderie a balm to my shaken nerves. As weeks turned into months, the fear receded dulled by time and routine. Yet, the lesson remained clear and profound, always be aware of your surroundings, trust your instincts, and know that it's okay to seek help. The experience had sharpened my senses, made me more cautious but also more connected to the community around me. In the end, the close call in the rain was a stark reminder of the precariousness of safety, a catalyst for change in how I protected myself and interacted with my environment. It underscored the importance of community and the strength found in collective support, lessons I carried with me long after the rain had stopped and the streets had dried. Story 18 It was during a fierce summer storm that I found the old farmhouse. Sheets of rain blurred the landscape, thunder rumbled like the heartbeat of the sky, and lightning flashed, illuminating the countryside in stark, 
fleeting glimpses. My car, an old hatchback, had struggled with the inclement weather, and when the engine began to cough and sputter, I knew I couldn't push it much further. I pulled off the main road following a muddy, overgrown track that led through a dense copse of trees. There, set back from the road and almost hidden by years of neglect, stood the farmhouse. It was a relic of a bygone era, its once white paint peeling, windows boarded up, and the porch siding under the weight of decay. Despite its dilapidated state, it offered shelter from the relentless storm, and with no cell service to call for help, I had little choice but to seek refuge there. I approached cautiously, the wind howling around me as if protesting my intrusion. The front door was ajar, swinging slightly with each gust. I pushed it open, the hinges groaning in protest, and stepped inside. The smell of damp wood and mold met me instantly, a testament to years of abandonment. My flashlight beam cut through the darkness, dust motes dancing in the artificial light. The interior was just as I had imagined, layers of dust covered everything. Old furniture lay scattered and broken, and cobwebs draped from the corners of the rooms. As I moved through the house, my footsteps echoed in the empty spaces, a lonely sound that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. In the living room, a grand fireplace took pride of place, its mantle lined with layers of dust. Above it, a family portrait hung askew, the faces of the subjects faded but still smiling, blissfully unaware of the decay around them. I turned away, exploring deeper into the house. The kitchen was a chaos of overturned chairs and a rusted stove. Jars of long spoiled preserves still sat on the shelves, their contents clouded and unrecognizable. I didn't linger there, the air felt heavier as if it held the breath of the past. It was when I reached the second floor that I found the study, and with it, the maps and photographs that would consume my thoughts for days to come. The room was lined with bookshelves, books still in place, their pages yellowed and curled. On the desk, a lamp lay overturned, its shade cracked. But it was the wall opposite the desk that drew my attention. It was covered in maps of the surrounding area, some so old they depicted landmarks long forgotten. Pinned among the maps were photographs, dozens of them, each marked with dates and times. My flashlight flickered over them, and I froze. The photographs were not just of landscapes and buildings, they were of people, candid shots taken without their knowledge. There were photos of hikers, families at picnics, young couples walking hand in hand, each image marked with precise coordinates and times, as if tracking their movements. A chill ran down my spine as I realized the scope of what I was seeing. This wasn't just a collection, it was surveillance, detailed and documented over what looked like decades. The realization that I was in the house of someone who had spent years spying on unknowing visitors to the area was deeply unsettling. I should have left then, but the storm outside was still raging, and my curiosity peaked despite my better judgment. I began to look through the photos, trying to see if there was anything that might explain why someone would do this. As I searched, I found newer items a digital camera, a laptop that looked out of place among the antiquity. I opened the laptop, half expecting it not to work, but it booted up to a desktop filled with folders. Each was meticulously labeled with dates and locations, just like the photographs on the wall. I clicked on one and the screen filled with images and videos, all surveillance, some recent. The most recent files were from just days ago. The realization hit me I wasn't alone. Someone was still using this place. I stood up, suddenly aware of every creak and moan of the old farmhouse. The storm outside seemed to quiet and I felt exposed, vulnerable. With no idea who might return, or when, I knew I had to leave, storm or no storm. I gathered my things quickly, casting one last look at the wall of surveillance. As I turned to leave, I noticed something else a schedule pinned beside the desk, 
marked with times and locations. My current location and today's date were circled. Panic set in, and I rushed from the room, down the stairs, and out into the storm. The rain had lessened somewhat, but the wind was still strong, buffeting me as I made my way back to my car. I drove away without looking back, the farmhouse disappearing behind me, swallowed by the trees. In the days that followed, I reported what I'd found to the local authorities, but when they went to investigate, the farmhouse was gone, consumed by fire. Nothing remained but ashes and questions that no one could answer. The memory of that day, of the maps, the photos, the meticulous records, haunts me still. It was a reminder of the shadows that exist in the corners of the world, watching, waiting, documenting. I never found out who was behind it or why, but the images of those unknowing subjects stayed with me, a stark reminder of the unseen eyes always lurking just out of sight. Story 19 The rain had not stopped for hours, turning the once familiar back roads into murky rivers of mud and debris. I was returning from a late business trip, eager to get home, but my usual route was impassable due to the flooding. Anxious to find any alternative, I turned down a seldom used road, hoping it would loop back toward the highway. Instead, it brought me to a crossroads, a place I'd never seen despite having lived in the area for years. The intersection was oddly barren, with no signs or markers, just four dirt roads branching off into the darkness. My car's headlights reflected off the wet surfaces, creating an eerie glow that barely penetrated the rain. I decided to stop and check my GPS, but frustratingly it couldn't find a signal. As I sat there, Trying to decide on a direction, I noticed other vehicles starting to appear. One by one, cars pulled up to the crossroads, stopping briefly before one of the drivers would get out and speak to a figure that seemed to emerge from the shadows. I squinted through my rain-soaked windows, trying to make out more details. The figure was cloaked, moving from one car to another, exchanging what looked like briefcases or packages. Each exchange was quick, the drivers then speeding off without hesitation. Curiosity mixed with a creeping unease as I watched. Who were these people? What were they exchanging at this deserted crossroads in the middle of a storm? I felt like I was witnessing something illicit, possibly dangerous. Yet before I could decide to leave, a car pulled up beside me. The driver, a middle-aged woman with anxious eyes rolled down her window and gestured frantically for me to do the same. Do you know where this road goes, she asked, her voice barely audible over the rain. No, I'm lost too, I replied, my voice tinged with nervousness. Do you know what's going on here? She shook her head, her eyes wide with fear. I stumbled upon this place. It looks like some kind of deal is going on. I'm too scared to drive off. They might see us talking and come after us. I nodded, understanding her fear. The isolation of the location, the anonymity of the night, and the strange rendezvous it was like a scene from a crime thriller. We both rolled up our windows and watched as another exchange was made. The cloaked figure seemed to notice us then, turning to stare in our direction. I felt a shiver run down my spine. The figure started walking towards us. Panic set in, and I started the car's engine, signaling to the woman to follow me. We chose one of the roads at random and sped away from the crossroads. I glanced in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see the figure or one of the cars following us, but there was nothing but darkness and rain. Driving without a destination, we eventually found ourselves back on a main road. I pulled over at a gas station, and the woman followed suit. Under the harsh fluorescent lights of the station, we introduced ourselves and shared our stories. Her name was Elaine, and like me, she had been trying to find a way around the storm-blocked roads. We decided to report what we had seen to the police. At the station, we were met with skepticism but they agreed to send a patrol to check the crossroads. 
Elaine and I exchanged numbers, promising to keep each other updated. A few days later, I received a call from the police department. They had gone to the crossroads but found nothing, no sign of any illicit activities or the mysterious cloaked figure. The rain had washed away any potential evidence, leaving only mud and unanswered questions. Elaine and I stayed in touch, occasionally discussing the bizarre event we had witnessed. We speculated about what it could have been a black market exchange, a gathering of some secret society, or perhaps something even more sinister. The lack of answers only fueled our imaginations and the growing legend of the crossroads among our friends and families. Months passed, and life returned to normal, but the mystery of that night remained. I avoided that road, not wanting to come upon the crossroads again. Yet, the memory of it lingered like a ghost story, a tale of caution and curiosity, forever etched in the stormy night. It was a stark reminder of the hidden layers of the world around us, places where the ordinary intersects with the shadowy fringes of society. And while the truth about the crossroads might never be revealed, it served as a reminder that sometimes, the safest paths are the ones we know far away from the unknown crossroads waiting in the dark. Story 20 The night was cold and rainy, the kind of weather that encourages a cozy gathering indoors rather than braving the elements outside. I was hosting a dinner party, an intimate affair with close friends to celebrate the end of a challenging project at work. The table was set with warm dishes, the wine was flowing, and laughter filled my small but welcoming apartment. As the evening progressed, the doorbell rang unexpectedly. I was puzzled, as all my invited guests were already present. Through the peephole, I saw a man, soaked to the bone, clutching a bottle of wine. Opening the door, I greeted him with a cautious smile. Hi, I hope I'm not too late. I'm a friend of Dan's. He mentioned this party and suggested I stop by, he said, his voice friendly but slightly rushed. Confused, I let him in, thinking perhaps Dan, always the social butterfly, had extended an invite without telling me. The man introduced himself as Greg, and he quickly ingratiated himself with the group, charming them with stories and witty comments. As the evening wore on, I noticed Greg's adeptness at blending in. He conversed with everyone as if he had known them for years, and his knowledge of personal details about my friends was uncannily accurate. At one point I pulled Dan aside and asked him about Greg. Greg? I thought he was your friend Dan said, a frown creasing his forehead. Alarm bells rang in my head. I excused myself and went to my study to think. It struck me then that I had never mentioned the party's location in the group chat, only in private messages to those invited. How had Greg known where to find my apartment? Returning to the living room, I watched Greg more critically. He caught my gaze, and his smile faltered for just a moment, revealing a hint of nervousness. I decided to confront him. Greg, can we talk in the kitchen for a moment, I asked. In the kitchen, I confronted him directly. How exactly do you know Dan, and how did you know about this party? Greg's charm faltered, and his eyes darted toward the hallway. Look, I must admit, I might have gotten my wires crossed. Maybe it was another Dan, he stammered. The situation didn't add up. I excused myself again and went to check my room in my office, a nagging suspicion growing in my mind. To my horror, I found my office door slightly ajar and my safe, hidden behind a painting, wide open. My heart sank as I saw that several valuable items were missing. Rushing back to the living room, I found that Greg had left. The front door was open, and the cool night air was blowing in. My friends were oblivious, caught up in their merriment. I quickly informed them of what had happened and called the police. The investigation that followed revealed the unsettling truth. Greg was a con artist known to the police for similar incidents. 
He had been following my social media and had pieced together information about my friends and the party from various posts. The bottle of wine he brought was stolen from a nearby store that evening. I felt a mix of anger and embarrassment. I had prided myself on being a good judge of character, and yet I had been thoroughly deceived. The incident was a wake-up call about privacy, the information we share online, and the people we trust. Months later, the police caught Greg in a similar act at another party. My stolen items were never recovered, but his arrest brought some closure. The dinner party became a story we would tell, a lesson wrapped in a bizarre and unsettling memory. From then on, I tightened my social media settings and became more cautious about personal information. I learned that even in the safety of one's home, amidst friends and familiar comforts, unexpected guests can bring unexpected dangers. The rain that night had not just brought a physical storm, but a storm that would ripple through my life, reminding me that vigilance should never take a night off. Story 21 As I navigated the twisting roads on a stormy night, the rain drummed against the windshield like a relentless symphony of chaos. Lightning streaked across the sky, illuminating the darkness in brief flashes. My heart raced with every crack of thunder, knowing the dangers that lurked in the shadows. Just as I reached a notorious stretch of road, where tales of accidents and disappearances whispered through the town like ghostly echoes, disaster struck. The engine of my car sputtered and died, leaving me stranded in the midst of the tempest. Panic surged through me as I frantically tried to restart the engine, but to no avail. Through the haze of rain and fear, I caught sight of a silhouette in the rearview mirror, a figure emerging from the inky blackness. My breath caught in my throat as the shadowy form approached, tapping on the window with an eerie calmness that sent shivers down my spine. With trembling hands, I hesitated before rolling down the window, unsure of what awaited me outside. The rain poured relentlessly, blurring the lines between reality and nightmare as I met the gaze of the stranger standing in the downpour. Please, the figure implored their voice barely audible above the storm. I need a ride. Every instinct screamed at me to refuse, to lock the doors and wait for help, but something in the stranger's eyes spoke of desperation, of a fear that mirrored my own. Against my better judgment, I unlocked the doors and allowed the mysterious passenger to enter the safety of my car. As we drove through the storm last night, the stranger remained unnervingly silent, their presence a haunting reminder of the dangers that lurked in the darkness. With each passing mile, the tension in the air thickened, suffocating me in a blanket of apprehension. The stranger's presence was unsettling, their features obscured by the shadows cast by the dim dashboard lights. I stole glances at them from the corner of my eye, trying to discern any hint of their intentions. But their face remained a mystery, hidden behind a veil of darkness. With the storm raging outside, the atmosphere inside the car grew heavier with each passing minute. The sound of rain drumming against the roof drowned out any attempts at conversation, leaving us both trapped in a suffocating silence. I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that settled in the pit of my stomach. Who was this stranger, and why were they out in the storm alone? Questions swirled in my mind, but I dared not voice them aloud fearing what answers they might bring. As we continued down the desolate road, the stranger finally broke the silence with a whispered request for me to pull over. My heart hammered in my chest as I complied, the headlights of the car casting eerie shadows on the surrounding trees. With a sense of foreboding, I watched as the stranger stepped out into the storm once more, disappearing into the darkness without a backward glance. The feeling of relief that washed over me was short-lived, replaced by a gnawing sense of dread. Alone once more, I found myself questioning the events of the night. Had I made a mistake in offering the stranger a ride? 
What dangers had I invited into my car, into my life? The sound of my own thoughts was drowned out by the relentless drumming of rain against the roof of the car. The storm showed no signs of abating, its fury unabated as it raged on into the night. With a heavy heart, I turned the key in the ignition, the engine roaring to life once more. But the sense of unease remained, a lingering reminder of the night's events and the stranger who had briefly entered my life like a ghost in the storm. As I drove on, the road stretching endlessly before me, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Every shadow seemed to hold a hidden threat, every rustle of leaves a whispered warning. But despite the fear that gripped me, I pressed on, determined to leave the horrors of the night behind me. Little did I know, the true nightmare had only just begun, lurking in the darkness just beyond the reach of my headlights. Story 22 In the dead of night, with rain cascading down in torrents, I found myself navigating the desolate countryside in a desperate bid to avoid the congestion of the main roads. The narrow back roads twisted and turned like serpents, leading me deeper into the heart of the storm. As I pressed on, determined to outpace the tempest that threatened to engulf me, disaster struck in the form of a fallen tree blocking my path. With a curse, I brought my car to a stop, the headlights casting eerie shadows across the rain-soaked landscape. Stepping out into the deluge, I approached the fallen tree, my footsteps muffled by the symphony of raindrops pelting the earth. It was then that I noticed something peculiar about the tree it hadn't fallen naturally, but rather it had been cut its trunk severed with deliberate precision. A sense of unease settled over me as I surveyed the scene, the realization sinking in that I was not alone in these forsaken woods. Fresh tire tracks marred the muddy ground, leading off into the darkness like a trail of breadcrumbs leading to an unknown destination. With trepidation gnawing at my insides, I hesitated before making a decision. Should I continue on this treacherous path, following the tire tracks into the unknown, or should I retreat to the safety of the main roads, leaving behind the mysteries that lurked in the shadows? In the end, curiosity won out over caution, driving me forward into the heart of the storm. With each step I took, the woods seemed to close in around me, the darkness swallowing me whole as I ventured deeper into the unknown. The rain continued to pour down relentlessly, soaking me to the bone as I followed the tire tracks deeper into the woods. Every sound seemed magnified in the stillness of the night, the rustle of leaves and the hoot of an owl sending shivers down my spine. As I trudged onward, the woods began to take on another worldly quality, the trees looming like silent sentinels in the darkness. Shadows danced across the forest floor playing tricks on my mind as I struggled to make sense of the surreal landscape. Hours seemed to pass as I stumbled through the woods, the rain showing no signs of abating. With each passing minute, my sense of unease grew, a nagging feeling that I was being watched by unseen eyes. Just when I thought I couldn't go on any longer, I stumbled upon a clearing in the woods, a small cabin nestled among the trees. Relief flooded through me as I approached the door, hoping to find shelter from the storm within its walls. To my surprise, the door swung open at my touch, revealing a dimly lit interior bathed in flickering candlelight. The air was heavy with the scent of earth and damp wood, lending the cabin an air of ancient mysticism. As I stepped inside, I was greeted by the sight of a figure seated at a wooden table, their features obscured by the shadows cast by the flickering candles. They looked up at me with eyes that seemed to pierce through the darkness, their gaze intense and unwavering. Welcome, traveler, they said, their voice echoing through the stillness of the cabin. You have stumbled upon the threshold of the unknown, where the boundaries between worlds blur and reality bends to the will of the forest. I stared at them in disbelief, unsure of what to make of their cryptic words. Who were they, and what secrets did they hold within the depths of this secluded cabin? 
But before I could voice my questions, a deafening roar filled the air, shaking the very foundations of the cabin. I rushed to the window, my heart pounding in my chest as I beheld a sight that chilled me to the core. The descent into darkness felt endless, the air rushing past me in a chaotic whirlwind as I tumbled through the abyss. Fear gripped me like icy claws, squeezing the breath from my lungs as I struggled to make sense of my surroundings. As I fell, fragments of memories flashed before my eyes the storm lashed night, the mysterious figure in the cabin, the sense of unease that had plagued me from the moment I set foot in the woods. Each image was a puzzle piece in a larger, more sinister tapestry, one that threatened to consume me whole. Just when I thought I could bear the darkness no longer, I landed with a jolt that knocked the wind from my lungs. Gasping for air, I struggled to my feet, the ground beneath me cold and unforgiving. Before me stretched a landscape unlike anything I had ever seen, a twisted realm where reality and nightmare coexisted in a fragile balance. The sky above was a swirling vortex of darkness, punctuated by flashes of lightning that illuminated the desolate landscape in brief, flickering bursts. In the distance, I could make out the silhouette of the cabin where my journey had begun, its windows glowing with an otherworldly light. It beckoned to me like a siren's call, promising answers to questions I dared not ask. With a sense of foreboding, I began to make my way towards the cabin, the ground beneath my feet shifting and morphing with each step. Shadows danced at the edge of my vision, whispering secrets that sent shivers down my spine. As I drew closer to the cabin, the air grew thick with anticipation, a palpable sense of dread hanging heavy in the air. Every instinct screamed at me to turn back, to flee this accursed place and never look back. But something compelled me to press on, a curiosity that burned like a fire in the pit of my stomach. I needed answers, needed to understand the mysteries that had brought me to this forsaken realm. As I reached the cabin, the door swung open of its own accord, revealing a scene straight out of a nightmare. The figure from before stood before me, their eyes ablaze with an otherworldly light, their form shifting and twisting like smoke in the wind. You have journeyed far, traveler, they said, their voice echoing through the darkness. But your journey has only just begun. I stared at them in disbelief, my mind reeling with the enormity of the situation. Who were they, and what did they want from me? Before I could voice my questions, the figure reached out a hand, beckoning me to follow them into the depths of the cabin. With a sense of trepidation, I stepped inside, the door closing behind me with a resounding thud. The interior of the cabin was bathed in an eerie half-light, the flickering candles casting strange shadows on the walls. Symbols adorned every surface, their meaning lost to me in the haze of confusion. As I followed the figure deeper into the cabin, a sense of dread settled over me like a suffocating blanket. I knew that whatever awaited me in the darkness, it would be far worse than anything I had ever imagined. And as the figure led me further into the depths of the unknown, I couldn't help but wonder if I would ever find my way back to the world I knew, or if I was doomed to wander this twisted realm for all eternity. Story 23 as the rain drummed against the window panes of my new apartment, casting distorted shadows across the room, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. A sense of unease settled over me like a heavy blanket, suffocating me in its grip as I moved through the darkness. Turning my gaze to the window, I saw my own reflection staring back at me, distorted by the rain street glass. But there, standing behind me in the room, was another figure a silhouette shrouded in darkness, its features obscured by the veil of night. My heart skipped a beat as I whirled around, expecting to come face to face with an intruder lurking in the shadows. But to my horror, the room was empty, devoid of any presence save for my own. 
A chill ran down my spine as I realized the truth the figure I had seen in the reflection was not outside the window but inside the apartment with me, lurking in the darkness where I could not see. With trembling hands I reached for the light switch, casting the room into stark illumination, but even as the darkness retreated, the sense of foreboding lingered, a shadowy specter haunting the corners of my mind. From that day forth I lived in constant fear, never knowing when the figure in the reflection would reveal itself once more, lurking just beyond the threshold of perception, waiting to plunge me into the depths of darkness from which there could be no escape. The Old Inn Nestled in the heart of the countryside, shrouded in a veil of mist and mystery, stood the old inn a relic of a bygone era, its weathered facade bearing witness to centuries of secrets buried within its walls. It was here, amidst the whispers of the wind and the creaking of floorboards worn smooth by the passage of time, that I sought refuge from the storm that raged outside. But as I lay in my bed, the steady drip, drip, drip of water echoing through the silence, I could not shake the feeling of being watched. Rising from my bed, I followed the sound to its source a locked door at the end of a dimly lit hallway, its surface slick with condensation. With a sense of trepidation, I sought out the innkeeper the following morning, hoping to uncover the truth behind the mysterious door that had captured my curiosity. But to my surprise, the innkeeper's face grew pale at the mention of a locked room, his eyes betraying a fear that mirrored my own. It hasn't been opened in years, he whispered, his voice barely audible above the din of the storm outside. Not since the last guest who stayed there never checked out. And so the mystery of the locked room remained unsolved, its secrets buried deep within the bowels of the old inn waiting to be unearthed by those brave enough to venture into the darkness that lurked within. The days turned into weeks, and still, the figure in the reflection haunted my every waking moment. I tried to convince myself that it was merely a trick of the light, a figment of my overactive imagination, but deep down, I knew the truth it was real, and it was coming for me. Desperate for answers, I delved into research, scouring old newspapers and dusty archives in search of any mention of a presence haunting my apartment building. But the more I searched, the more elusive the truth became, slipping through my fingers like grains of sand. In my quest for answers, I stumbled upon a thread of stories detailing the history of the building, a history steeped in tragedy and darkness. It was said that the apartment complex had been built upon the site of an old graveyard, its foundations resting atop the final resting place of souls long forgotten. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I realized that the figure in the reflection was no ordinary specter, it was a restless spirit, trapped between worlds, seeking solace in the land of the living. Determined to put an end to the haunting once and for all, I sought out the help of a paranormal investigator hoping to uncover the truth behind the ghostly apparition that had plagued me for so long. Together we delved into the history of the building, uncovering long buried secrets that shed light on the restless spirit's true identity. It was a tale of love and loss, betrayal and revenge a story as old as time itself, woven into the very fabric of the building's foundations. And as we unraveled the mysteries of the past, we came face to face with the vengeful spirit that had haunted me for so long. In a final showdown between the living and the dead, we confronted the spirit, laying to rest the grievances that had bound it to this earthly realm. And as its ethereal form dissipated into the darkness, I felt a sense of peace wash over me, knowing that I had finally put an end to the haunting that had tormented me for so long. But even as the ghostly apparition faded into the night, I knew that its memory would linger on, a reminder of the thin veil that separates the world of the living from the realm of the dead. And though I had vanquished the spirit that had haunted me, I knew that the journey was far from over, for in the darkness, new mysteries awaited, lurking just beyond the edge of perception, waiting to be uncovered by those brave enough to seek them out.
Story 24. In the heart of the countryside, nestled amidst a forest thick with ancient trees, stood a mansion forgotten by time. Its once grand facade was now weathered and worn, its windows boarded up and its gardens overgrown with weeds. It was a relic of a bygone era, a monument to a family long since vanished from memory. As I stumbled upon the mansion during one of my solitary walks through the woods, I couldn't help but feel drawn to its eerie allure. The air was heavy with the scent of decay, and a sense of foreboding settled over me like a suffocating shroud. With each step I took towards the mansion, the feeling of unease grew stronger, a whispering voice at the back of my mind urging me to turn back. But curiosity got the better of me, driving me forward into the heart of the darkness that enveloped the forgotten mansion. As I approached the front door, I hesitated, my hand hovering over the tarnished brass handle. What secrets lay beyond this threshold? What mysteries awaited me within the crumbling walls of the mansion? With a deep breath, I pushed open the door, the hinges creaking in protest as I stepped into the dimly lit foyer. The air was thick with dust, and the floorboards groaned beneath my weight as I made my way further into the mansion's depths. Every room I explored held its own secrets, its own tales of a life long since past. In the grand ballroom, I could almost hear the faint strains of music drifting through the air, echoing the laughter and revelry of a time gone by. In the library, shelves lined with ancient tomes whispered of forbidden knowledge and hidden truths. But it was in the depths of the mansion's cellar that I uncovered the darkest secret of all a hidden chamber concealed behind a false wall, its entrance obscured by years of neglect and decay. As I stepped into the chamber, the air grew heavy with the weight of centuries-old secrets. In the center of the room stood a pedestal, upon which rested a single, ornately carved box. With trembling hands, I lifted the lid, revealing a collection of letters and documents bound in faded ribbon. As I sifted through the papers, a story began to unfold a tale of love and betrayal, of family feuds and long-held grudges. It was the story of the mansion's former inhabitants, the Van Der Voort family, a once wealthy dynasty brought to ruin by greed and jealousy. As I read through the letters, I could feel the weight of their sorrow and regret, their hopes and dreams dashed by the cruel hand of fate. But as I delved deeper into the mystery of the mansion, I soon realized that the Vandervoort family's story was far from over, for within the shadows of the forgotten mansion, something sinister lurked, a malevolent force that hungered for vengeance. As night fell and the darkness closed in around me, I felt the presence of something watching, waiting, lurking in the shadows. The air grew thick with tension, and a sense of impending doom settled over the mansion like a shroud. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I knew that I had stumbled upon something far more sinister than I had ever imagined. The mansion held secrets that were not meant to be unearthed, and I had unwittingly become entangled in a web of darkness from which there could be no escape. As I made my way through the mansion's labyrinthine corridors, I could feel the malevolent presence drawing closer, its icy grip tightening around my throat. Every shadow seemed to hold a hidden threat, every whisper of the wind a warning of impending danger. But despite the fear that gnawed at my insides, I pressed on, driven by a desperate need to uncover the truth behind the mansion's dark history. Little did I know, the answers I sought would lead me down a path fraught with peril, where the line between reality and nightmare blurred into obscurity. And as I stood on the brink of discovery, I realized that the forgotten mansion held secrets far more sinister than I could have ever imagined. For within its crumbling walls, something ancient and malevolent stirred, waiting to unleash its wrath upon the world once more. Story 25 As I stood in the attic of my grandfather's old farmhouse, surrounded by the musty scent of time and memory, my eyes fell upon a forgotten chest tucked away in the corner. It called to me, a relic of the past waiting to be discovered amidst the dust and cobwebs that had gathered over the years. 
With trembling hands, I approached the chest, my curiosity piqued by the promise of untold treasures hidden within. As I lifted the lid, a beam of light pierced the darkness, illuminating the contents within a jumble of artifacts, each whispering of a bygone era long since faded into obscurity. Nestled amongst the relics lay an ancient map, its edges yellowed with age, its ink faded with the passage of time. My heart quickened with excitement as I traced the faded lines with trembling fingers, my eyes alight with wonder at the trail it laid out before me a path through the woods behind the house, marked with an X that seemed to beckon me into the unknown. Without hesitation, I made a decision. I would follow the map, unraveling the secrets it held and uncovering the mysteries hidden within the depths of the forest. With the map clutched tightly in my grasp, I set out into the rain-soaked wilderness, the cool mist clinging to my skin as I ventured deeper into the unknown. Each step brought me closer to the hidden treasure that lay buried beneath the forest floor. My senses heightened with anticipation as I navigated through the dense undergrowth and tangled vines that obscured my path. The sound of my footsteps echoed through the stillness of the woods, mingling with the gentle rustle of leaves in the breeze. As I walked, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, a sense of unease settling over me like a shroud. Yet driven by an insatiable thirst for adventure, I pressed on, determined to uncover the truth hidden within the heart of the forest. And then, at long last, I found it a weather-beaten chest half buried in the earth, its wooden frame worn and faded with age. With trembling hands, I pried open the lid, revealing a trove of ancient artifacts, rusty tools stained with what appeared to be dried blood, relics of a time long since forgotten. My heart raced with excitement as I sifted through the treasures within, each item a piece of the puzzle that would unlock the secrets of the past. But as I gazed upon the remnants of a bygone era, a chill ran down my spine, a sense of unease settling over me like a shroud. For in that moment, I realized that some secrets were best left buried, their mysteries lost to the sands of time, lest they unleash forces beyond our comprehension. The artifacts spoke of a darker time, a time of violence and chaos that threatened to consume all who dared to uncover its truth. And so with a heavy heart I made a decision. I would return the chest to its resting place, leaving behind the echoes of a past best forgotten as I retreated into the safety of the present. Yet, even as I walked away, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had stumbled upon something far more sinister than I could have ever imagined. As I emerged from the depths of the forest, the sun hung low in the sky, casting long shadows across the landscape. But even in the fading light, I couldn't shake the sense of foreboding that lingered in the air, a reminder of the darkness that lurked just beyond the edge of our understanding. And so, with a heavy heart and a mind full of questions, I returned to the farmhouse, the weight of the past heavy upon my shoulders. For though I had uncovered the secrets hidden within the depths of the forest, I knew that some mysteries were never meant to be solved, their truths too terrible to bear. As I settled into bed that night, the memory of the ancient map and the treasures it held danced through my dreams a reminder of the thin veil that separates the world of the living from the realm of the dead. And though I longed for answers, I knew that some secrets were best left untouched, their power too great for mortal hands to wield. And so, with a sigh of resignation, I closed my eyes and let sleep claim me, knowing that the mysteries of the past would forever remain shrouded in darkness, their secrets lost to the sands of time. Story 26 In the heart of the rain-soaked forest, where the trees loomed like ancient sentinels and the undergrowth twisted and tangled like the tendrils of some primordial beast, I found myself wandering amidst the whispers of the wild. The canopy above was thick with foliage, casting dappled shadows upon the forest floor as raindrops pattered softly against the leaves, creating a symphony of sound that echoed through the woods. As I navigated through the dense thicket, 
A sense of solitude settled over me like a heavy cloak. It was a solitude both serene and unsettling, a reminder of the vastness of the natural world and the insignificance of humanity in its midst. Yet, despite the quiet beauty of the forest, there was an underlying tension in the air, a sense that I was not alone in this wilderness. And then, amidst the swaying branches and the rustling leaves, I stumbled upon a lone figure, a hiker, his clothes sodden with rain, his face etched with fear. He emerged from the shadows like a specter, his eyes wide and wild as he stumbled towards me, his voice a desperate plea for help. Without hesitation, I approached the lost soul, his words tumbling forth in a frantic rush as he recounted his tale of terror. He spoke of shadows that lurked in the underbrush, of whispers carried on the wind, of a presence that haunted his every step. With a sense of trepidation, I listened intently, my senses on high alert as I scanned the surrounding forest for any signs of danger. But as we ventured deeper into the heart of the woods, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. The air grew thick with tension, the atmosphere charged with an otherworldly energy that sent shivers down my spine. And then, from the depths of the forest, came the sound of shouting men and barking dogs, their voices echoing through the darkness like the howls of some ancient beast. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I realized that we were not alone, that there were others in these woods, and they were not friendly. As the shouts grew louder and the sounds of pursuit drew nearer, the lost hiker suddenly broke into a run, his fear driving him forward with an urgency that left me rooted to the spot. For a moment, I stood frozen amidst the rustling leaves and the distant sounds of chaos, unsure of what to do next. But as the voices drew closer and the shadows of the forest seemed to close in around me, I knew that I had no choice but to follow the hiker's lead and flee into the safety of the open field beyond. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I sprinted through the underbrush, my heart pounding in my chest as I dodged branches and leaped over fallen logs in my frantic bid for escape. Behind me, the sounds of pursuit grew louder, a relentless drumbeat that echoed through the night like a harbinger of doom. And then, just as I reached the edge of the forest, I stumbled and fell, my breath coming in ragged gasps as I struggled to regain my footing. But before I could rise, a hand reached out from the darkness, pulling me to my feet with surprising strength. I looked up to see the hiker standing before me, his eyes wide with fear as he gestured for me to follow. With a nod of understanding, I fell into step beside him, our footsteps echoing through the darkness as we raced towards the safety of the open field beyond. As we emerged from the shadowy depths of the forest, the rain fell in a steady downpour, washing away the traces of our ordeal as if cleansing us of our sins. Yet, despite the relative safety of the open field, I couldn't shake the feeling that we had narrowly escaped a fate far worse than death, that we had stumbled upon something dark and sinister lurking within the depths of the woods. And as I looked back at the forest, its twisted branches silhouetted against the stormy sky, I knew that I would never forget the terror of that night, nor the lost hiker who had led me into the heart of darkness and back again. For in the end, it was a reminder that even in the most serene of landscapes, Danger lurks just beyond the edge of perception, waiting to ensnare those foolish enough to wander too close. Story 27 Alone in the dead of night, with the rain drumming against the roof of the gas station like a relentless drumbeat, I found myself in the quiet company of solitude. It was the kind of night that seemed to stretch on forever each minute dragging by with an agonizing slowness as I waited for the storm to pass and the first light of dawn to break through the darkness. The fluorescent lights buzzed overhead, casting a harsh glow over the empty aisles and deserted pumps. Outside, the world was cloaked in shadow, the only sound the steady patter of rain against the pavement. I leaned against the counter, my eyes heavy with exhaustion as I fought to stay awake the monotony of the night shift threatening to lull me into a state of half-consciousness. 
And then, just when I thought I was truly alone, a car pulled up outside, its headlights cutting through the darkness like twin beacons in the night. With a sense of foreboding, I watched as a figure emerged from the shadows, their clothes soaked through with rain, their face obscured by the hood of their jacket. As they approached, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off, that there was more to this stranger than met the eye. Their movements were deliberate, almost cautious, as if they were wary of being seen. And yet, there was a sense of urgency in their demeanor, a purpose that drove them forward through the storm. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I watched as the figure entered the gas station the bell above the door chiming softly in their wake. They moved with a quiet grace, their footsteps muffled by the symphony of raindrops that surrounded us. And then, without a word, they made their way to the shelves, browsing the aisles with a casual indifference that belied the tension in the air. For hours, the stranger lingered, their eyes never leaving mine, their gaze burning into my soul with an intensity that sent shivers down my spine. There was something about them, something unsettling and otherworldly, that set my teeth on edge and made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. And then, just as suddenly as they had appeared, they vanished into the night, slipping away like a ghost into the mist. I watched them go, my heart pounding in my chest as I struggled to make sense of what had just happened. But try as I might, I couldn't shake the feeling that this encounter was far from over, that there was more to this stranger than I could ever hope to understand. As the hours wore on and the storm raged outside, I found myself lost in a maze of thoughts and emotions, each more confusing than the last. Who was the stranger who had visited me in the dead of night, and what had brought them to my doorstep? And why did their presence fill me with such a sense of unease? And then, as I locked up the gas station for the night, I found a note tucked beneath the door, a single sentence scrawled in jagged handwriting that sent a chill down my spine. Beware the darkness, for it holds secrets best left undiscovered. I stared at the words, my heart pounding in my chest as a cold sweat broke out across my brow. Who had left this note for me, and what did they mean by their cryptic message? As I turned the words over in my mind, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that there was something lurking in the shadows, waiting to ensnare me in its grasp. With a shiver, I tucked the note into my pocket and made my way home, the darkness of the night pressing in around me like a suffocating blanket. And as I walked, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being followed, that the stranger from the gas station was still out there watching and waiting for the perfect moment to strike. But try as I might, I couldn't outrun the feeling of unease that clung to me like a second skin, a constant reminder of the darkness that lurked just beyond the edge of perception. And as I slipped into bed and closed my eyes, I knew that sleep would offer no respite from the terrors that haunted my waking hours that the night would bring only more questions and more uncertainty leaving me to wonder what other secrets lay hidden in the shadows, waiting to be uncovered. Story 28 In the heart of the storm, with lightning streaking across the sky like the wrath of some vengeful deity, I found myself seeking refuge from the tempest in the crumbling ruins of an old mill. It stood as a sentinel against the fury of the elements, its weathered walls a testament to the passage of time and the stories it held within. As I stepped inside, seeking shelter from the relentless rain that beat down upon the earth like a drum, I was greeted by a cacophony of sound, a symphony of groaning timbers, creaking floorboards, and the distant rumble of thunder that reverberated through the very foundation of the building. With a sense of trepidation, I ventured further into the darkness, my footsteps echoing off the crumbling walls as I sought out the source of the noise. The air was thick with the scent of damp earth and decay, a tangible reminder of the mill's long abandoned state. Yet, despite the oppressive atmosphere, 
There was an undeniable allure to the place, an echo of history whispering through the shadows, beckoning me deeper into its depths. And then, as I rounded a corner, I stumbled upon a sight that chilled me to the bone, a lone figure standing amidst the ruins, its form hunched and twisted, its eyes vacant and glassy as it stared off into the distance. It seemed to exist outside of time, a spectral presence haunting the decaying remnants of the mill. With a sense of dread gnawing at my insides, I turned to flee. The sound of my footsteps drowned out by the deafening cacophony that surrounded me. But even as I ran, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched that unseen eyes followed my every move, tracking my progress through the labyrinthine corridors of the old mill. As I reached the exit, I paused, my hand hovering over the rusted latch as I cast one final glance back at the figure standing amidst the ruins. There was something hauntingly familiar about it, something that tugged at the edges of my memory like a half-remembered dream. But before I could dwell on the thought, a bolt of lightning illuminated the sky, casting the mill in stark relief against the darkness. And then, with a sense of finality, I fled into the storm leaving behind the old mill and the mysteries that lurked within its crumbling walls. But even as I emerged into the raging tempest, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had stumbled upon something far greater than I could ever hope to understand that the old mill held secrets beyond my wildest imagination, waiting to be uncovered by those brave enough to seek them out. As I trudged through the mud and the rain, the image of the figure standing amidst the ruins burned itself into my mind its silent vigil a reminder of the countless stories woven into the fabric of the old mill. And though I knew that some secrets were best left undisturbed, I couldn't help but wonder what other mysteries lay hidden within its decaying walls, waiting to be revealed to those willing to brave the storm. Story 29 As I drove home through the storm-lashed streets, my mind wandered through the torrents of rain, each drop a tiny reminder of the world's chaos outside my car. The night had taken on an eerie quality, the darkness broken only by the sporadic flicker of lightning, illuminating the shapes of buildings and trees like fleeting specters in the night. It was amidst this tempest that I stumbled upon the abandoned car relic of a bygone era, its rusted frame a testament to neglect, its doors yawning open as if an invitation. My headlights cast long, stretching shadows across the rain-soaked pavement, adding to the sense of foreboding that hung heavy in the air. With a mixture of curiosity and trepidation, I brought my car to a halt, the engine purring softly as I surveyed the scene before me. The rain continued to fall in sheets, drumming against the windshield with a relentless intensity that seemed to drown out all other sounds save for the pounding of my own heart. Stepping out into the darkness, I was immediately engulfed by the storm, the rain soaking through my clothes, chilling me to the bone. I hesitated for a moment, the sense of unease that had been gnawing at my insides growing stronger with each passing second. But curiosity got the better of me, and with a deep breath, I made my way towards the abandoned vehicle. As I drew closer, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that unseen eyes followed my every move from the shadows. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, and a shiver ran down my spine as I reached out to push the door closed. But before I could, something caught my eye a glint of metal in the darkness, half hidden beneath the driver's seat. With a sense of trepidation, I reached down and retrieved the object a key, tarnished with age but still gleaming faintly in the dim light. My mind raced with possibilities as I examined it, wondering what secrets it might unlock, what mysteries it might hold. But before I could ponder further, a sound pierced the night a distant rumble of thunder, echoing like a warning from the heavens above. Startled, I glanced around suddenly aware of how exposed I was, how vulnerable to the elements and whatever else might be lurking in the darkness. With a sense of urgency, I hurried back to my car, the rain coming down harder now, 
as if the storm itself sought to drive me away. But as I reached for the door handle, a voice called out from the darkness a whisper, barely audible above the roar of the rain. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I strained to listen, to make out the words that were carried to me on the wind. But the voice was gone as quickly as it had come, leaving me alone once more in the darkness, with nothing but the pounding of rain for company. Shaken but determined, I climbed back into my car and continued on my way, the abandoned vehicle fading into the distance behind me. But try as I might, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that lingered like a shadow in the back of my mind, a constant reminder that I was not alone in the night. Hours passed as I drove through the storm, the rain showing no signs of letting up, the darkness pressing in on all sides like a suffocating embrace. And then, just when I thought I couldn't bear it any longer, I saw a light in the distance a beacon of hope amidst the storm. Relief flooded through me as I drew closer, the light growing brighter with each passing moment until at last, I reached the safety of my own home. But even as I stepped inside and closed the door behind me, I couldn't shake the feeling that something lingered out there in the darkness, waiting for its moment to strike. And so as I curled up in bed and listened to the rain drumming against the window, I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets the night might hold, what other terrors lurked just beyond the edge of sight. But for now at least I was safe, cocooned in the warmth and comfort of my own home, far away from the storm-lashed streets and the abandoned car that still haunted my dreams. Story 30 The relentless patter of rain against my windshield filled the car with a dull, rhythmic sound as I navigated the winding roads that cut through the dense forest. It was a dark and stormy night, the kind that seemed to belong more to the realm of fiction than reality. My hands gripped the steering wheel tightly, my knuckles white with tension, as I strained to see through the veil of water cascading down the glass. As I rounded a bend, my headlights illuminated a figure standing by the side of the road, hunched over and drenched from head to toe. A hitchhiker, it seemed, seeking refuge from the storm. Against my better judgment, I felt a pang of sympathy for the poor soul braving the elements alone. Without hesitation, I pulled over and rolled down the window. Need a ride, I called out, trying to make my voice heard over the roar of the rain. The figure turned towards me, their face obscured by the shadows and the deluge of rain. For a moment, there was silence, broken only by the sound of raindrops hitting the pavement. Then, with a slow, deliberate movement, the hitchhiker nodded and approached the car. As they climbed into the back seat, I couldn't help but notice how they seemed to glide rather than walk, their movements unnaturally smooth and fluid. But in the darkness and the rain, I dismissed it as a trick of the light, a figment of my imagination brought on by the eerie atmosphere of the night. Thanks for stopping, the hitchhikers said, their voice soft and muffled by the sound of the rain. No problem, I replied forcing a smile as I pulled back onto the road. Where are you headed? Anywhere but here came the cryptic response. I glanced at the stranger in the rearview mirror, but their face was hidden in shadow, impossible to make out in the dim light of the car. Something about them unsettled me, a feeling of unease creeping up my spine like icy tendrils. We drove on in silence the only sound the steady rhythm of the rain against the roof of the car. With each passing mile, the feeling of unease grew stronger, gnawing at the edges of my consciousness like a hungry beast. Finally, unable to bear the silence any longer, I cleared my throat and spoke up. So, uh, what's your name, I asked, trying to keep my voice casual. The hitchhiker didn't respond immediately, as if lost in thought. Then, after a long pause, they spoke. I have no name, they said, their voice sending shivers down my spine. Names are meaningless to me. I swallowed hard, trying to shake off the sense of dread that threatened to consume me. Something was not right about this hitchhiker, something unnatural and otherworldly. 
We continued on in silence, the tension in the car thick enough to cut with a knife. I stole glances at the hitchhiker in the rearview mirror, but their face remained hidden, a blank mask devoid of features. Suddenly, without warning, a figure loomed in the middle of the road ahead, illuminated by the headlights of the car. I slammed on the brakes, my heart pounding in my chest as the car skidded to a stop just inches from the mysterious figure. But when I looked back in the rearview mirror, the hitchhiker was gone, vanished into thin air as if they had never been there at all. Only a damp seat remained as evidence of their presence. I sat there for a moment, my hands trembling on the steering wheel, trying to make sense of what had just happened. But there was no rational explanation, no logical reason for the hitchhiker's sudden disappearance. With a sense of unease still lingering in the air, I slowly pulled back onto the road and continued on my journey, the memory of the hitchhiker's haunting presence lingering in the back of my mind like a ghostly echo. Story 31 The rain fell in torrents, hammering against the pavement with a relentless force that seemed to drown out all other sound. I huddled beneath the shelter of the bus stop, my coat pulled tight around me in a feeble attempt to shield myself from the deluge. It was a storm unlike any I had ever seen, the kind that seemed to consume the world in its fury. As I waited, shivering and damp, for the bus to arrive, my eyes were drawn to a flickering street lamp on the corner. Beneath its wavering light, I spotted a figure standing, motionless, their form obscured by the shadows cast by the dancing raindrops. At first, I dismissed it as a trick of the light, a figment of my imagination brought on by the eerie atmosphere of the storm. But as I watched, the figure seemed to solidify its shape becoming more distinct with each flash of lightning that illuminated the night sky. A chill ran down my spine as I realized that the figure was no trick of the light, but a real presence lurking in the darkness. Its outline was jagged and distinct, as if it were made of smoke or shadow, twisting and warping with each burst of lightning. I glanced around, but the bus stop was deserted the other passengers having sought shelter elsewhere from the relentless downpour. It was just me and the mysterious figure, alone in the storm. I felt a surge of unease as I watched the figure, unsure of what to do. Should I approach it, confront it, or simply ignore it and wait for the bus to arrive? A thousand questions raced through my mind, each one more frantic and panicked than the last. Just then, I heard the distant rumble of an engine, growing louder and louder as the bus rounded the corner and pulled up to the curb. With a sense of relief, I hurried aboard, eager to escape the oppressive atmosphere of the storm and the unsettling presence of the shadowy figure. As the bus pulled away from the stop, I stole a glance back through the rain-streaked window, half expecting to see the figure still standing there, watching me with its cold, unblinking gaze. But to my surprise, it was gone, vanished into the night as if it had never been there at all. Yet despite its absence, its chilling silhouette remained etched in my mind, haunting me like a ghostly memory that refused to fade away. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had encountered something unnatural and otherworldly, something that belonged to the realm of nightmares rather than reality. For the rest of the journey, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that lingered in the air like a foul stench. I kept glancing nervously out the window, half expecting to see the shadowy figure lurking in the darkness, waiting to pounce when I least expected it. But no matter how hard I looked, there was nothing there, only the empty streets and the relentless rain pounding against the pavement. And yet, despite the lack of any physical evidence, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that the shadowy figure was still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for its next victim. When the bus finally reached my stop, I practically leaped off, eager to put as much distance between myself and the shadowy figure as possible. I hurried home, my heart racing and my mind filled with a thousand terrifying possibilities. 
As I lay in bed that night, the storm still raging outside, I couldn't shake the feeling that the shadowy figure was still out there, lurking in the darkness, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. And try as I might, I knew that I would never be able to forget the chilling silhouette that had haunted me at the bus stop, forever etched in my mind like a scar upon my soul. Story 32 Seeking shelter from the storm, I stumbled upon an old, dilapidated house tucked away at the edge of the forest. The rain lashed against my skin, driven by the howling wind that seemed determined to tear through every layer of protection. With each step I sank deeper into the mud, my clothes clinging to me like a second skin. Desperation drove me forward, seeking refuge from the relentless fury of the tempest. The house stood as a solitary sentinel against the onslaught of nature, its windows shattered, its walls adorned with ivy that seemed to cling to its decaying form like a grieving widow. With trepidation, I pushed open the creaking door and stepped inside. The air was heavy with the musty scent of abandonment, and the floorboards groaned beneath my weight as I made my way further into the darkness. As I ventured deeper into the bowels of the house, the sound of the rain's relentless drumming gradually faded, replaced by soft whispers that seemed to echo from the walls themselves. It was as if the very structure of the house was alive, murmuring secrets long forgotten to the ravages of time. Driven by curiosity, I followed the whispers, winding my way through the labyrinthine corridors until I stumbled upon a hidden room tucked away behind a tapestry covered in dust and cobwebs. Pushing it aside, I found myself confronted with a sight that sent shivers down my spine. The room was filled with waterlogged journals, their pages swollen and discolored from years of exposure to the dampness that permeated the house. With trembling hands, I reached out and picked up one of the journals, its cover adorned with faded ink that spelled out a name long forgotten by the world. Flipping through the pages, I realized they were the desperate writings of a soul lost to the rain-soaked depths. Each entry spoke of anguish and despair, of a life consumed by the relentless onslaught of the storm that raged outside. It was as if the author had poured their very essence onto the pages, their words a haunting echo of the suffering they had endured. As I read on, I felt a sense of unease settle over me, as if the weight of the past was pressing down upon my shoulders, threatening to engulf me in its suffocating embrace. But still, I could not tear myself away from the haunting tale that unfolded before my eyes. The author spoke of a love lost to the storm, of a heart shattered into a million pieces by the cruel hand of fate. They spoke of dreams dashed upon the rocks of reality, of hopes extinguished like candles in the wind. And yet, amidst the despair, there was a glimmer of defiance, a flicker of resilience that refused to be snuffed out. As I delved deeper into the journals, I began to unravel the mystery of the house and its tragic inhabitant. I learned of a family torn apart by tragedy, of secrets buried beneath layers of deceit and betrayal. And I realized that the whispers that filled the air were not merely echoes of the past, but the voices of those who had been silenced by the cruel hand of fate. With each page I turned, I felt a connection forming between myself and the author, as if their words were reaching out across the chasm of time to touch my soul. And as the storm raged on outside, I found myself drawn deeper into the heart of the mystery, determined to uncover the truth that lay buried beneath the surface. Hours passed in a blur as I lost myself in the pages of the journals, the rain's relentless drumming fading into the background as I became immersed in the story of a life cut short by tragedy. And as dawn broke and the first light of morning filtered through the shattered windows, I made a promise to the soul whose words had touched my heart. I would not let their story be forgotten. Gathering up the journals, I tucked them beneath my arm and made my way back out into the storm, the whispers of the past still echoing in my ears. And as I disappeared into the mist-shrouded forest, 
I knew that I carried with me not just the words of a lost soul, but the echoes of a love that refused to be extinguished. Story 33 Lost in the woods during a torrential downpour, every rustle of the leaves and snap of a twig felt like the approach of something sinister. The rain cascaded down in relentless sheets, turning the forest into a labyrinth of mud and shadows. With each step I sank deeper into the mire, my boots heavy with the weight of the sodden earth. Desperation clawed at my chest as I pushed forward, the darkness pressing in around me like a suffocating cloak. Every breath was a struggle, every heartbeat a drumming reminder of my isolation, and yet I pressed on, driven by the primal instinct to survive. The forest seemed to come alive with unseen eyes watching my every move, their presence lingering in the air like a lingering fog. I could feel their gaze upon me, cold and unrelenting, as if the very trees themselves were judging my every step. As the hours stretched on and the storm raged overhead, I began to lose all sense of time and direction. The path ahead twisted and turned, leading me deeper into the heart of the forest's embrace. With each passing moment, the world around me seemed to blur and distort, as if reality itself were shifting beneath my feet. And then, just when I felt as if I could go no further, I stumbled upon a clearing bathed in an eerie silver light. It was as if the storm had parted to reveal a sanctuary amidst the chaos, a haven of peace amidst the turmoil. Relief flooded through me as I collapsed onto the damp grass, my breath coming in ragged gasps. For a moment I allowed myself to believe that I was safe, that the worst of the storm had passed, but deep down I knew that my respite would be short-lived. As I huddled beneath the shelter of the trees, the forest seemed to whisper secrets that sent shivers down my spine. It was as if the very earth itself was alive with the echoes of the past, its voice a haunting melody that reverberated through the darkness. With trembling hands I reached out and traced the patterns in the bark, feeling the pulse of the forest beneath my fingertips, and as I closed my eyes and allowed myself to drift, I felt a strange sense of connection forming between myself and the world around me. But then, just as quickly as it had come, the feeling faded, leaving me alone once more in the embrace of the storm. And as I pressed forward, the darkness seemed to close in around me, swallowing me whole. Hours passed in a blur as I stumbled through the underbrush, my senses dulled by exhaustion and fear. Every sound seemed amplified, every shadow a potential threat lurking just out of sight. And yet, I pressed on, driven by the desperate hope that salvation lay just beyond the next bend in the path. But as the storm raged on and the darkness deepened, I began to lose all sense of hope. The forest seemed to stretch on endlessly in every direction, its twisting paths leading me in circles until I could no longer tell up from down, left from right. And then, just when I felt as if I could go no further, I stumbled upon a clearing bathed in an eerie silver light. It was as if the storm had parted to reveal a sanctuary amidst the chaos, a haven of peace amidst the turmoil. Relief flooded through me as I collapsed onto the damp grass, my breath coming in ragged gasps. For a moment I allowed myself to believe that I was safe, that the worst of the storm had passed but deep down I knew that my respite would be short-lived. As I huddled beneath the shelter of the trees, the forest seemed to whisper secrets that sent shivers down my spine. It was as if the very earth itself was alive with the echoes of the past, its voice a haunting melody that reverberated through the darkness. With trembling hands, I reached out and traced the patterns in the bark, feeling the pulse of the forest beneath my fingertips and as I closed my eyes and allowed myself to drift, I felt a strange sense of connection forming between myself and the world around me. But then, just as quickly as it had come, the feeling faded, leaving me alone once more in the embrace of the storm. 
and as I pressed forward, the darkness seemed to close in around me, swallowing me whole. Hours passed in a blur as I stumbled through the underbrush, my senses dulled by exhaustion and fear. Every sound seemed amplified, every shadow a potential threat lurking just out of sight. And yet, I pressed on, driven by the desperate hope that salvation lay just beyond the next bend in the path. But as the storm raged on and the darkness deepened, I began to lose all sense of hope. The forest seemed to stretch on endlessly in every direction, its twisting paths leading me in circles until I could no longer tell up from down, left from right. And then just when I felt as if I could go no further, I stumbled upon a clearing bathed in an eerie silver light. It was as if the storm had parted to reveal a sanctuary amidst the chaos, a haven of peace amidst the turmoil. Relief flooded through me as I collapsed onto the damp grass, my breath coming in ragged gasps. For a moment, I allowed myself to believe that I was safe, that the worst of the storm had passed. But deep down, I knew that my respite would be short-lived. As I huddled beneath the shelter of the trees, the forest seemed to whisper secrets that sent shivers down my spine. It was as if the very earth itself was alive with the echoes of the past, its voice a haunting melody that reverberated through the darkness. With trembling hands, I reached out and traced the patterns in the bark, feeling the pulse of the forest beneath my fingertips. And as I closed my eyes and allowed myself to drift, I felt a strange sense of connection forming between myself and the world around me. But then, just as quickly as it had come, the feeling faded, leaving me alone once more in the embrace of the storm. And as I pressed forward, the darkness seemed to close in around me, swallowing me whole. Hours passed in a blur as I stumbled through the underbrush, my senses dulled by exhaustion and fear. Every sound seemed amplified, every shadow a potential threat lurking just out of sight. And yet, I pressed on, driven by the desperate hope that salvation lay just beyond the next bend in the path. But as the storm raged on and the darkness deepened, I began to lose all sense of hope. The forest seemed to stretch on endlessly in every direction, its twisting paths leading me in circles until I could no longer tell up from down, left from right. And then, just when I felt as if I could go no further, I stumbled upon a clearing bathed in an eerie silver light. It was as if the storm had parted to reveal a sanctuary amidst the chaos, a haven of peace amidst the turmoil. Relief flooded through me as I collapsed onto the damp grass, my breath coming in ragged gasps. For a moment I allowed myself to believe that I was safe, that the worst of the storm had passed. But deep down, I knew that my respite would be short-lived. Story 34 Standing alone in the rain-soaked cemetery, I felt a chill run down my spine as I noticed a solitary raven perched atop a weathered tombstone. Its sleek feathers glistened in the dim light, and its eyes bore into mine with an unnerving intensity. For a moment, time seemed to stand still as we locked gazes, the world around us fading into insignificance. The rain drummed against the earth, a steady rhythm that echoed the pounding of my heart. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that every movement I made was being scrutinized by unseen eyes. And as the raven spread its wings and took flight, a sense of foreboding washed over me like a wave crashing against the shore. With a flap of its wings, the bird disappeared into the storm, leaving me alone amidst the silent graves. The sound of the rain seemed to grow louder, filling the air with a cacophony of whispers that sent shivers down my spine. It was as if the very earth itself was alive with the echoes of the past, its voice a haunting melody that reverberated through the darkness. For a moment I stood rooted to the spot, unsure of what to do next, but then, Driven by a primal instinct to flee, I turned and ran, my footsteps echoing off the tombstones as I raced through the cemetery. The rain lashed against my skin, soaking me to the bone, but I paid it no mind, 
consumed by the overwhelming sense of dread that had taken hold of me. As I stumbled through the darkness, the world around me seemed to blur and distort, as if reality itself were shifting beneath my feet. Shadows danced at the edge of my vision, their forms twisting and contorting with each passing moment. And yet through it all, I could feel the presence of the raven looming over me like a dark cloud, its eyes burning into my soul. Hours passed in a blur as I wandered aimlessly through the storm, my mind consumed by fear and uncertainty. Every rustle of the leaves, every snap of a twig, sent my heart racing, my senses on high alert for any sign of danger. And yet, no matter how hard I tried to shake the feeling, I couldn't escape the overwhelming sense of doom that hung over me like a shroud. And then, just when I felt as if I could go no further, I stumbled upon a clearing bathed in an eerie silver light. It was as if the storm had parted to reveal a sanctuary amidst the chaos, a haven of peace amidst the turmoil. Relief flooded through me as I collapsed onto the damp grass, my breath coming in ragged gasps. For a moment I allowed myself to believe that I was safe, that the worst of the storm had passed. But deep down, I knew that my respite would be short-lived. As I huddled beneath the shelter of the trees, the forest seemed to whisper secrets that sent shivers down my spine. It was as if the very earth itself was alive with the echoes of the past, its voice a haunting melody that reverberated through the darkness. With trembling hands I reached out and traced the patterns in the bark, feeling the pulse of the forest beneath my fingertips, and as I closed my eyes and allowed myself to drift, I felt a strange sense of connection forming between myself and the world around me. But then, just as quickly as it had come, the feeling faded, leaving me alone once more in the embrace of the storm. And as I pressed forward, the darkness seemed to close in around me, swallowing me whole. Hours passed in a blur as I stumbled through the underbrush, my senses dulled by exhaustion and fear. Every sound seemed amplified, every shadow a potential threat lurking just out of sight. And yet, I pressed on, driven by the desperate hope that salvation lay just beyond the next bend in the path. But as the storm raged on and the darkness deepened, I began to lose all sense of hope. The forest seemed to stretch on endlessly in every direction, its twisting paths leading me in circles until I could no longer tell up from down, left from right. And then, just when I felt as if I could go no further, I stumbled upon a clearing bathed in an eerie silver light. It was as if the storm had parted to reveal a sanctuary amidst the chaos, a haven of peace amidst the turmoil. Relief flooded through me as I collapsed onto the damp grass, my breath coming in ragged gasps. For a moment, I allowed myself to believe that I was safe, that the worst of the storm had passed. But deep down I knew that my respite would be short-lived. As I huddled beneath the shelter of the trees, the forest seemed to whisper secrets that sent shivers down my spine. It was as if the very earth itself was alive with the echoes of the past, its voice a haunting melody that reverberated through the darkness. With trembling hands, I reached out and traced the patterns in the bark, feeling the pulse of the forest beneath my fingertips. And as I closed my eyes and allowed myself to drift, I felt a strange sense of connection forming between myself and the world around me. But then, just as quickly as it had come, the feeling faded leaving me alone once more in the embrace of the storm. And as I pressed forward, the darkness seemed to close in around me, swallowing me whole. Hours passed in a blur as I stumbled through the underbrush, my senses dulled by exhaustion and fear. Every sound seemed amplified, every shadow a potential threat lurking just out of sight. And yet, I pressed on, driven by the desperate hope that salvation lay just beyond the next bend in the path. But as the storm raged on and the darkness deepened, I began to lose all sense of hope. The forest seemed to stretch on endlessly in every direction, 
its twisting paths leading me in circles until I could no longer tell up from down, left from right. And then, just when I felt as if I could go no further, I stumbled upon a clearing bathed in an eerie silver light. It was as if the storm had parted to reveal a sanctuary amidst the chaos, a haven of peace amidst the turmoil. Relief flooded through me as I collapsed onto the damp grass, my breath coming in ragged gasps. For a moment I allowed myself to believe that I was safe, that the worst of the storm had passed, but deep down I knew that my respite would be short-lived. As I huddled beneath the shelter of the trees, the forest seemed to whisper secrets that sent shivers down my spine. It was as if the very earth itself was alive with the echoes of the past, its voice a haunting melody that reverberated through the darkness. With trembling hands I reached out and traced the patterns in the bark, feeling the pulse of the forest beneath my fingertips. And as I closed my eyes and allowed myself to drift, I felt a strange sense of connection forming between myself and the world around me. But then, just as quickly as it had come, the feeling faded, leaving me alone once more in the embrace of the storm. And as I pressed forward, the darkness seemed to close in around me, swallowing me whole. Story 35 Walking along a deserted road in the pouring rain, I felt a sense of isolation that seemed to stretch on endlessly with each step. The storm clouds hung low in the sky, casting a pall of darkness over the landscape, and the rain fell in relentless torrents, drenching me to the bone. With each passing moment, the world around me seemed to blur and distort, as if reality itself were shifting beneath my feet. The sound of my footsteps echoed off the pavement, the only sign of life in an otherwise empty expanse of wet asphalt. And then, just when I felt as if I were the only soul left in the world, I heard it the faint sound of footsteps echoing behind me. At first I dismissed it as a trick of the mind, a figment of my imagination conjured up by the loneliness of the road. But as the sound grew louder, closer, I knew that I could no longer ignore it. Turning around, I saw nothing but the empty expanse of wet pavement stretching into the distance. The rain fell in a steady rhythm, obscuring my vision and casting shadows that danced at the edge of my perception. And yet, through it all, the footsteps persisted, their rhythm steady and relentless. With each passing moment, my heart beat faster my breath coming in ragged gasps as I struggled to make sense of the phantom presence haunting my every move. Who or what could be following me in the dead of night, amidst the fury of the storm? Driven by a primal instinct to flee, I quickened my pace, my footsteps echoing off the pavement as I raced through the darkness. But no matter how fast I ran, the footsteps seemed to keep pace, their rhythm matching my own with uncanny precision. As the rain continued to fall, I cast furtive glances over my shoulder, searching for any sign of the elusive presence that dogged my every step, but each time I found nothing but the empty expanse of road stretching out behind me, disappearing into the swirling mists of the storm. And yet, despite the absence of any visible threat, I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end, a primal sense of dread coiling in the pit of my stomach. It was as if the very air around me was charged with an unseen energy, crackling with the anticipation of some unknown horror lurking just beyond the edge of perception. Driven by a desperate need to escape, I veered off the road and into the surrounding forest, the branches overhead offering scant protection from the relentless downpour. The ground beneath my feet was slick with mud, threatening to send me sprawling with each hurried step. But still, I pressed on, driven by a singular purpose to put as much distance between myself and the unseen presence haunting my every move. And yet, no matter how far I ran, the footsteps seemed to follow, their relentless rhythm echoing through the darkness like a drumbeat heralding my demise. With each passing moment, 
The sense of dread that gripped me grew stronger, threatening to engulf me in its suffocating embrace. Hours passed in a blur as I stumbled through the underbrush, my senses dulled by exhaustion and fear. Every rustle of the leaves, every snap of a twig, sent my heart racing, my mind consumed by the relentless pursuit of the unknown. And then, just when I felt as if I could go no further, I stumbled upon a clearing bathed in an eerie silver light. It was as if the storm had parted to reveal a sanctuary amidst the chaos, a haven of peace amidst the turmoil. Relief flooded through me as I collapsed onto the damp grass, my breath coming in ragged gasps. For a moment I allowed myself to believe that I was safe, that the worst of the storm had passed but deep down I knew that my respite would be short-lived. As I huddled beneath the shelter of the trees, the forest seemed to whisper secrets that sent shivers down my spine. It was as if the very earth itself was alive with the echoes of the past, its voice a haunting melody that reverberated through the darkness. With trembling hands I reached out and traced the patterns in the bark, feeling the pulse of the forest beneath my fingertips. And as I closed my eyes and allowed myself to drift, I felt a strange sense of connection forming between myself and the world around me. But then, just as quickly as it had come, the feeling faded, leaving me alone once more in the embrace of the storm. And as I pressed forward, the darkness seemed to close in around me, swallowing me whole. Hours passed in a blur as I stumbled through the underbrush my senses dulled by exhaustion and fear. Every sound seemed amplified, every shadow a potential threat lurking just out of sight. And yet, I pressed on, driven by the desperate hope that salvation lay just beyond the next bend in the path. But as the storm raged on and the darkness deepened, I began to lose all sense of hope. The forest seemed to stretch on endlessly in every direction its twisting paths leading me in circles until I could no longer tell up from down, left from right. And then, just when I felt as if I could go no further, I stumbled upon a clearing bathed in an eerie silver light. It was as if the storm had parted to reveal a sanctuary amidst the chaos, a haven of peace amidst the turmoil. Relief flooded through me as I collapsed onto the damp grass, my breath coming in ragged gasps, for a moment I allowed myself to believe that I was safe, that the worst of the storm had passed. But deep down, I knew that my respite would be short-lived. As I huddled beneath the shelter of the trees, the forest seemed to whisper secrets that sent shivers down my spine. It was as if the very earth itself was alive with the echoes of the past, its voice a haunting melody that reverberated through the darkness. With trembling hands, I reached out and traced the patterns in the bark, feeling the pulse of the forest beneath my fingertips, and as I closed my eyes and allowed myself to drift, I felt a strange sense of connection forming between myself and the world around me. Story 36 Peering into a rain-filled puddle, I caught a glimpse of my own reflection, and something else. The distorted figure lurked just beneath the surface, its twisted features contorted into a sinister grin. It was as if the rain had cast a spell, distorting reality and revealing a glimpse of the darkness that lurked just beneath the surface. For a moment, I stood frozen in place, my heart pounding in my chest as I struggled to make sense of what I had seen. But then, with a shaky breath, I forced myself to look again, hoping against hope that it had all been a trick of the light. But when I dared to peer into the puddle once more, my reflection had returned to normal, the distorted figure nowhere to be seen. Relief flooded through me, washing away the tendrils of fear that had wrapped themselves around my heart. It must have been my imagination, I told myself, a product of the storm and the eerie atmosphere of the rain-soaked streets. And yet, deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more sinister at play, something lurking just beyond the edge of perception. With a shudder, I tore my gaze away from the puddle and continued on my way, 
the memory of the distorted figure lingering in the back of my mind like a haunting melody. The rain continued to fall, a steady rhythm that echoed the pounding of my heart as I navigated the deserted streets. But no matter how hard I tried to push the encounter from my mind, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that every shadow held the promise of something sinister lurking just out of sight. With each step, the sense of unease grew, until it felt as if the very air around me was charged with an otherworldly energy. As I walked, I couldn't help but glance over my shoulder, half expecting to see the twisted figure from the puddle lurking just behind me. But each time, there was nothing but the empty expanse of the rain-soaked streets, the only sound the steady patter of rain against the pavement. Hours passed in a blur as I wandered through the city, the storm raging overhead like a tempestuous symphony. It was as if the very fabric of reality had been warped by the rain, casting everything in a distorted light that played tricks on the mind. And then, just when I felt as if I could go no further, I stumbled upon a narrow alleyway tucked away between two buildings. The darkness seemed to beckon me forward, its depths shrouded in mystery and intrigue. With a hesitant step, I ventured into the alley, the sound of my footsteps echoing off the walls like a drumbeat in the night. The air was heavy with the scent of rain and decay, and yet there was something else lurking beneath the surface, something that sent a shiver down my spine. As I pressed forward, the darkness seemed to close in around me, swallowing me whole in its suffocating embrace. Shadows danced at the edge of my vision, their forms twisting and contorting with each passing moment. And yet through it all, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being guided by an unseen hand, that my every move was being watched by eyes that glowed in the darkness. With each step, the sense of unease grew until it felt as if the very walls of the alley were closing in around me. I could feel the weight of the darkness pressing down upon me, threatening to consume me whole if I dared to linger too long. And then, just when I felt as if I could go no further, I stumbled upon a small clearing at the end of the alley. In its center stood a single lamppost, its light casting a flickering glow that illuminated the darkness like a beacon in the night. With a sigh of relief, I made my way towards the light, the sense of unease slowly fading as I stepped into its warm embrace. For a moment, I allowed myself to bask in its comforting glow, the memory of the twisted figure from the puddle fading into the recesses of my mind. But even as I stood beneath the lamppost, bathed in its golden light, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still watching me lurking just beyond the edge of the darkness. And as I glanced back towards the alley, I caught a glimpse of movement out of the corner of my eye, a shadow darting through the night like a phantom in the wind. With a start, I turned and fled into the safety of the light, the memory of the distorted figure from the puddle burning in my mind like a brand. And as I disappeared into the darkness, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had stumbled upon something beyond my comprehension, something lurking just beneath the rain-soaked streets, waiting to be discovered. Story 37 Lost on a desolate stretch of coastline in the midst of a storm, I felt the fury of the tempest whipping against my skin, threatening to tear me asunder with each gust of wind. The rain fell in sheets obscuring my vision and soaking me to the bone, while the crash of thunder reverberated through the air like a primal drumbeat. In the midst of this chaos, a haunting melody drifted on the wind, cutting through the roar of the storm with its ethereal beauty. Mesmerized, I found myself drawn towards the source of the sound, my footsteps guided by an unseen force that seemed to pull me ever closer to the water's edge. As I stumbled through the rain-soaked sand, the melody grew louder, filling the air with its hypnotic allure. It was a song of longing and loss, of beauty and despair, that seemed to pierce straight through to my soul, stirring emotions I had long thought buried beneath the weight of the world. With each step closer to the water, the storm raged harder, as if warning me to turn back before it was too late. 
but I could not resist the siren's call, its melody weaving a spell around me that held me captive in its embrace. And then, just when I thought I could go no further, I reached the water's edge and saw her standing amidst the crashing waves, her figure illuminated by the flickering light of a distant lighthouse. She was beautiful beyond words, with long hair that cascaded down her back like a river of liquid silver, and eyes that gleamed with an otherworldly light. Her voice was like a symphony of angels, each note carrying the weight of a thousand whispered secrets. And as she sang, the storm seemed to falter, its fury tempered by the power of her song. Mesmerized, I took a step closer, the chill of the water seeping into my bones as I waded into the surf. The waves crashed against me with a force that threatened to drag me under, but still I pressed forward, unable to tear my gaze away from the siren's hypnotic form. With each passing moment, the world around me seemed to fade away, until there was nothing left but the siren and her song. It was as if time itself had stopped, leaving me suspended in a moment of pure, unadulterated bliss. But then, just as suddenly as it had begun, the spell was broken, and I found myself gasping for breath as the full force of the storm crashed down upon me once more. The siren song grew fainter, carried away on the wind like a whisper in the night, leaving me standing alone amidst the raging sea. For a moment I stood frozen in place, my mind reeling from the intensity of the encounter. But then, with a shaky breath, I turned and fled back towards the safety of the shore, the memory of the siren's haunting melody lingering in the depths of my soul like a bittersweet refrain. As I stumbled back onto the rain-soaked sand, I knew that I would never forget the siren's song, nor the beauty and danger that lurked within its depths. And though I had escaped with my life, I knew that a part of me would always remain tethered to the sea, drawn by the irresistible allure of the unknown. Story 38 The rain cascaded in sheets, transforming the countryside into a watery blur of greens and browns. I squinted through the windshield of my car, the wipers beating a frantic rhythm against the deluge. It was the type of rain that seemed to wash away all traces of civilization leaving behind a primal landscape untouched by human hands. As I navigated the winding road, my headlights pierced through the mist, illuminating the path ahead in a feeble attempt to carve out a safe passage. It was then that I first caught sight of it the silhouette of a carriage, its outline blurred by the relentless downpour. My heart skipped a beat as I watched it materialize from the darkness a relic from a bygone era haunting the lonely road. The carriage seemed to hover on the edge of existence, flickering in and out of sight like a specter summoned from the depths of myth. Its wooden frame creaked with each gust of wind, and I could almost hear the echo of hoofbeats on the rain-soaked earth. It was a scene straight out of a gothic novel, an apparition from the annals of folklore. Fear seized me like a vice as I approached, my foot instinctively easing off the accelerator. What manner of entity inhabited that ethereal chariot? Was it a harbinger of doom, a messenger from the realm of the dead? I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end as I contemplated the possibilities. With trembling hands, I gripped the steering wheel, my knuckles turning white against the leather. Should I press on, brave the unknown, and risk crossing paths with whatever entity haunted that spectral carriage? Or should I heed the warning whispered by my instincts and retreat to the safety of familiar surroundings? A bolt of lightning streaked across the sky, illuminating the landscape in a blinding flash of white. In that moment of clarity, I made my decision. Veering off the road, I sought refuge in the shelter of the trees, my heart pounding in my chest like a drumbeat of primal fear. The rain continued to fall in a relentless torrent, drumming against the roof of my car like the steady pulse of a heartbeat. I sat in silence, my breath fogging up the windows as I watched the phantom carriage fade into the distance, swallowed up by the darkness. 
Time seemed to lose all meaning as I waited, cocooned in the safety of my metal shell. Minutes stretched into hours, the only sound the steady patter of rain against glass. Eventually, exhaustion overcame my fear, and I drifted into an uneasy sleep, haunted by dreams of ghostly carriages and shadowy figures lurking in the darkness. When I awoke, the rain had ceased, replaced by the soft light of dawn filtering through the canopy above. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I peered out into the clearing, half expecting to find the phantom carriage waiting for me in the shadows. But there was nothing. No trace of the spectral chariot, no sign of the otherworldly presence that had haunted my nightmares. It was as if the whole encounter had been nothing more than a trick of the mind, a figment of my imagination born from the darkness and the rain. Shaken but determined, I started up my car and resumed my journey the memory of the phantom carriage fading like a dream upon waking. But as I drove on, leaving the lonely road behind me, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had glimpsed something beyond the veil of reality, something that defied explanation and lingered in the corners of my mind like a half-remembered ghost story. Story 39 the storm raged outside, its fury echoing in the hollow halls of the ancient church. Seeking refuge from the tempest, I stumbled through the heavy wooden doors, my clothes drenched and my spirits dampened by the relentless downpour. The interior of the church was dimly lit, the flickering candles casting long shadows against the stone walls. As I made my way further into the sanctuary, my eyes were drawn to a solitary figure, standing in the corner a statue of a woman, her form shrouded in robes of stone. Intrigued by the lifelike detail of the carving, I approached, the soft glow of the candles casting an ethereal light upon her tear-streaked face. Her eyes were closed in silent sorrow, her mouth frozen in a perpetual expression of anguish, but it was the tears that captured my attention real tears, glistening like diamonds in the dim light as if carved from the very essence of grief itself. I reached out a trembling hand, hesitant to disturb the sanctity of the moment. The stone felt cool and smooth beneath my fingertips, yet there was a warmth to it, a sense of life lurking beneath the surface. It was as if the statue possessed a soul of its own, a spirit trapped within the confines of its stony prison. As the rain beat against the stained glass windows, I couldn't shake the feeling that the statue's sorrowful gaze followed me wherever I went. It was as if she were reaching out to me, beckoning me to share in her anguish, to bear witness to the depths of her despair. Lost in contemplation, I sank to my knees before the statue, my thoughts consumed by questions without answers. Who was she, this weeping woman carved from stone? What sorrow had driven her to shed tears of such profound sorrow? And why had fate brought me to this sacred place on this stormy night? The minutes stretched into hours as I sat in silent communion with the statue, the flickering candles casting shifting shadows across the cold stone floor. It was then that I noticed something strange, a faint glimmer of light emanating from beneath the statue's feet, as if a secret lay hidden beneath the surface. With trembling hands, I reached out and traced the outline of the base, my fingers probing for some hidden mechanism or hidden compartment. And then, as if by magic, the stone yielded to my touch, sliding aside to reveal a small alcove hidden beneath the surface. Inside, nestled among folds of fabric, lay a delicate silver locket, its surface tarnished with age. With trembling hands, I lifted the locket from its hiding place, the metal warm against my skin. I could feel the weight of centuries pressing down upon me, the weight of history and memory intertwined. Gingerly, I opened the locket, revealing a faded daguerreotype nestled within a portrait of a woman, her features hauntingly familiar, her eyes filled with a sadness that mirrored my own. It was as if I were gazing into a mirror, a reflection of my own soul staring back at me from across the ages. But as I studied the portrait, 
A sense of recognition washed over me a memory half forgotten, a fragment of a dream. And then it all came rushing back the woman in the portrait, the tears carved from stone, the stormy night that had brought me to this sacred place. She was me, or rather, a version of me from another time, another life. A life filled with sorrow and regret, a life cut short by tragedy and loss. And as I stared into her eyes, I realized that her tears were my own, shed not for the past, but for the future, for all the joys and sorrows that lay ahead. With a sense of peace settling over me, I replaced the locket within its hidden alcove, the stone sliding shut with a soft click. And as I rose to leave the church behind, I knew that I carried a piece of her with me, a reminder of the interconnectedness of all things of the eternal dance of light and shadow that binds us together across time and space. Story 40 In the heart of the rain-drenched city, where the streets gleamed like rivers of silver under the pallid light of the moon, I stumbled upon an anomaly in abandoned playground. Its rusted swing swayed eerily in the wind, creaking and groaning with each gust that swept through the desolate landscape. Ignoring the warning bells ringing in the recesses of my mind, I approached, drawn by a strange and inexplicable curiosity. The playground was a relic of a bygone era, a testament to a time when laughter and joy echoed through its rusting metal structures. Now, however, it stood silent and forlorn, a ghostly reminder of the passage of time and the transience of human existence. As I stepped onto the damp sand beneath my feet, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, of unseen eyes peering out from the shadows. The hairs on the back of my neck prickled with unease as I surveyed the deserted playground, my senses heightened by the eerie stillness that hung heavy in the air. The swings swayed gently in the wind, their chains rattling like ghostly whispers in the night. I reached out a hand to touch one, feeling the rough texture of the rusted metal beneath my fingertips. It was cold and damp, the remnants of raindrops clinging to its surface like tears shed for a forgotten past. With a shiver, I turned away from the swings, my gaze drifting towards the other structures scattered across the playground a crumbling slide, a dilapidated jungle gym, a weather-beaten merry-go-round frozen in time. Each one seemed to hold a story of its own a memory trapped within the confines of its decaying frame. But it was the centerpiece of the playground that drew me in a towering structure that loomed over the rest, its skeletal frame reaching towards the heavens like the bones of some long-forgotten giant. It was a maze of twisted metal and crumbling concrete, its once vibrant colors faded and peeling with age. With a sense of trepidation, I approached the maze, the sound of my footsteps echoing in the empty space around me. The closer I drew, the more pronounced the feeling of being watched became, until it felt as though a thousand unseen eyes were boring into my soul. As I entered the maze, the darkness closed in around me, enveloping me in its suffocating embrace. The air was thick with the scent of mildew and decay, the remnants of a thousand rainy nights trapped within the labyrinthine corridors. With each turn I took, the feeling of unease grew stronger, until it felt as though I were being guided by some unseen force an invisible hand pushing me ever deeper into the heart of the darkness. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, the feeling vanished, replaced by a sense of profound stillness. I emerged from the maze into a small clearing, the moonlight filtering through the canopy above in silver shafts of light. In the center of the clearing stood a lone figure, a statue of a child, its features weathered and worn by time. In its outstretched hand, it held a single red balloon, its surface cracked and faded with age. As I approached, a sense of recognition washed over me, a memory half forgotten, a fragment of a dream. I reached out a trembling hand to touch the statue, feeling the rough texture of the stone beneath my fingertips. And then, in that moment of clarity, I understood. 
The playground was not abandoned at all, it was a sanctuary, a place where memories lingered like whispers in the wind, waiting to be discovered by those brave enough to seek them out. With a sense of reverence, I placed a hand over my heart and whispered a silent thank you to the spirits of the past. And as I turned to leave the playground behind, I knew that I carried a piece of its magic with me, a reminder of the power of imagination and the enduring legacy of childhood dreams. Story 41 Rain fell in sheets, cascading down from the heavens like tears shed by a grieving sky. I hurried through the rain-soaked streets, clutching my umbrella tightly, as if it were a shield against the storm. Little did I know, it would soon become a harbinger of dread, a conduit for the supernatural forces that roam the darkness. As I navigated the labyrinthine alleys of the city, the wind howled like a chorus of lost souls, sending shivers down my spine. With each gust, my umbrella twisted and contorted, its fabric straining against the invisible forces that sought to tear it from my grasp. Unnerved, I quickened my pace, eager to escape the chilling presence that seemed to lurk just beyond the edge of my perception. But no matter how fast I walked, the haunting feeling persisted, a cold knot of fear tightening in the pit of my stomach. I glanced up at the umbrella, its shadowy silhouette looming above me like a specter from a nightmare. It was then that I noticed something strange, a flicker of movement, a hint of movement within the folds of fabric. With trembling hands, I reached out to inspect the umbrella, my fingers tracing the contours of its surface. And then to my horror, I felt something stir beneath the fabric, a presence, cold and malevolent, lurking just beneath the surface. Heart pounding, I tried to discard the umbrella, to cast it aside like a cursed relic. But it clung to me like a vengeful spirit, refusing to be cast aside. With a sense of dread creeping over me, I realized that I was not alone, that the umbrella was no ordinary object, but a vessel for something far darker, far more sinister. Desperate to escape its grasp, I sought refuge in the nearest shelter, a decrepit alleyway, its walls stained with the memories of a thousand rainy nights. But even there, I could not shake the feeling of being watched, of unseen eyes peering out from the shadows. With a sinking heart, I realized that I was trapped, ensnared in a web of darkness that stretched far beyond the confines of the physical world, and as the rain continued to fall, I knew that I had no choice but to confront the malevolent force that lurked within the umbrella. Summoning every ounce of courage I possessed, I reached out and grasped the handle of the umbrella, steeling myself for whatever horrors lay ahead. With a sharp tug, I wrenched it open revealing the darkness that lurked within. But instead of the expected emptiness, I was greeted by a swirling vortex of shadows, a gateway to realms beyond the comprehension of mortal minds. And within that darkness, I sensed a presence, a whisper of malevolence, a hint of something ancient and terrible. With a trembling voice, I called out into the abyss, daring the darkness to reveal itself. And then, with a deafening roar, it answered a creature of nightmares, its form twisted and distorted by the unfathomable depths of its power. Paralyzed with fear, I watched as the creature emerged from the shadows, its eyes burning with an otherworldly light. It reached out with skeletal hands, its touch like ice against my skin. But just as all hope seemed lost, a sudden burst of courage surged within me. With a defiant cry, I lashed out with the umbrella, channeling the last of my strength into a single blow. And then, with a sound like thunder, the darkness shattered, dispersing into the night like smoke on the wind. The creature let out a wail of agony, its form dissolving into nothingness before my eyes. Exhausted but victorious, I collapsed to the ground the rain washing away the remnants of the nightmare that had plagued me. And as I lay there gasping for breath, I knew that I had faced the darkness and emerged victorious, a survivor of the haunted umbrella's sinister grip. Story 42 
As the storm raged outside, its fury echoing through the night like a chorus of angry spirits, I sought solace in the sanctuary of my backyard. The rain beat against the windows, a relentless drumming that threatened to drown out all other sounds. But amidst the chaos, there was one constant, a gentle tinkling, like the laughter of fairies dancing on the wind. I stepped outside, the cool mist enveloping me like a lover's embrace. In the center of the yard hung a set of wind chimes, their delicate forms swaying in the breeze. Each one was a work of art, crafted from shimmering metal and adorned with intricate designs that glinted in the pale moonlight. As I listened to their soothing melody, a sense of peace washed over me, calming the tumultuous storm within my soul. It was as if the chimes were a beacon of hope amidst the darkness, a reminder that beauty could still be found even in the midst of chaos. But as the night wore on, the melody began to change, twisting and warping into something altogether more sinister. The gentle tinkling turned into a cacophony of whispers, each one more chilling than the last. I frowned, my senses on high alert as I strained to make out the words carried on the wind. At first they were barely audible, a faint murmur in the back of my mind, like the distant echo of a forgotten dream. But as the whispers grew louder, their words became clearer, their meaning more ominous. They spoke of things long forgotten, of secrets buried deep within the earth, of darkness lurking just beyond the edge of perception. Fear gripped me like a vice as I listened to the haunting whispers, their voices weaving a tapestry of dread around me. I stumbled backwards, my heart pounding in my chest as I realized the true nature of the wind chimes they were not just instruments of music, but conduits for something far more sinister. With trembling hands, I reached out to tear the chimes from their hooks, desperate to silence the whispers that threatened to consume me. But as I grasped the metal, a shock ran through my body, as if I had touched a live wire. I recoiled in horror, the whispers growing louder with each passing moment. They echoed in my mind, a symphony of madness that threatened to drive me to the brink of insanity. With a cry of desperation, I tore the chimes from their hooks, hurling them into the darkness with all the strength I could muster. But even as they fell, the whispers persisted, carried on the wind like the haunting echoes of lost souls crying out from the darkness. I sank to my knees, tears mingling with the rain as I struggled to make sense of what was happening. How could something so beautiful be tainted by such darkness? What malevolent force had taken hold of the wind chimes, twisting their music into a symphony of horror? As I pondered these questions, a sense of unease settled over me, like a shroud of darkness descending from above. The storm continued to rage outside, the rain falling in torrents that threatened to wash away all traces of sanity. But amidst the chaos, there was one thing I knew for certain the whispering wind chimes were no longer welcome in my backyard. They were a reminder of the darkness that lurked just beyond the edge of perception, a darkness that would haunt me long after the storm had passed. Story 43 Working the graveyard shift at a remote gas station was always a lonely affair, but on nights like this, when the rain poured down in torrents and the wind howled like a banshee, it felt like I was the last person left in the world. The fluorescent lights flickered overhead, casting a sickly pallor over the deserted stores I watched the rain cascade down the windows, feeling a sense of unease settle over me like a suffocating shroud. Outside, the darkness stretched on for miles, broken only by the occasional flash of lightning that illuminated the desolate landscape in brief, stark bursts. The sound of the rain drumming against the roof was a constant companion, a steady rhythm that echoed the pounding of my heart as I watched and waited, alone in the silence of the night. As the hours passed, my mind began to wander, drifting into the realm of half-formed thoughts and fractured memories. I thought of home, of warm fires and laughter echoing through the halls. I thought of friends, of faces long since forgotten, lost to the sands of time. And I thought of the darkness outside, 
of the unknown horrors that lurked just beyond the edge of my vision. It was then that I saw them strange figures emerging from the darkness, their forms obscured by the relentless downpour. They moved with an unnatural grace, their movements fluid and sinuous as they slithered through the rain-soaked streets. With a sense of mounting dread, I realized that they were heading towards the gas station, drawn by some unseen force that called out to them from the depths of the night. Their faces were hidden beneath hoods and cloaks, their features shrouded in shadow as they drew nearer, their eyes glinting with an otherworldly light. I watched in horror as they approached, their footsteps echoing in the empty silence of the store. With trembling hands, I reached for the phone, my fingers fumbling with the buttons as I dialed for help. But there was no answer, only the steady drone of the dial tone mocking me from the receiver. Panic rose within me like a tidal wave, threatening to engulf me in its icy grip. With a sense of desperation, I turned to the door, ready to make my escape. But the figures were already there, their dark forms blocking the way, their eyes burning with an intensity that sent a shiver down my spine. With no other choice, I backed away, retreating further into the depths of the store as the figures closed in around me. I could hear their whispers now, a haunting melody that seemed to echo in the very recesses of my mind. I tried to block them out, to focus on anything other than the terror that threatened to consume me, but it was no use. Their voices were like a siren song, drawing me ever closer to the brink of madness. And then, just as suddenly as they had appeared, the figures were gone, disappearing into the night like phantoms in the mist. I stood alone in the darkness, my heart pounding in my chest as I struggled to make sense of what had just happened. With trembling hands, I locked the doors, praying that whatever lurked outside would remain there, hidden in the shadows. But deep down, I knew that they would return drawn back to the gas station by some unseen force that defied all reason and logic. As the rain continued to fall, I huddled behind the counter, waiting for the dawn to break and chase away the shadows that lurked just beyond the edge of my vision. But even as the first light of morning crept over the horizon, I knew that the darkness would always remain, a silent sentinel watching over the forgotten graveyard shift. Story 48 Watching the rain fall from my window was always a soothing ritual, a comforting reminder of the natural rhythms of the world outside. But on this particular evening, as the storm clouds gathered on the horizon and the first drops of rain began to fall, I noticed something strange a peculiar phenomenon that sent a shiver down my spine. The raindrops instead of pattering against the ground in a gentle rhythm, seemed to vanish before they hit the earth, as if swallowed by some unseen force. At first, I dismissed it as a trick of the light, a figment of my imagination born from the dimly lit room and the shifting shadows cast by the storm. But as I watched, transfixed by the strange occurrence, I realized that there was something undeniably unnatural about it. The raindrops disappeared with a silent grace, their translucent forms shimmering like dewdrops in the morning light before fading into nothingness. Mesmerized by the sight, I stepped closer to the window, pressing my face against the cool glass as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. But the more I stared, the more perplexed I became, unable to shake the feeling that there was something deeply unsettling about the vanishing raindrops. With a sense of unease settling over me like a heavy blanket, I tore myself away from the window and ventured outside, drawn by an inexplicable curiosity to witness the phenomenon up close. The rain fell in a steady cascade, each droplet shimmering like liquid silver in the glow of the streetlights. As I stepped onto the damp pavement, feeling the cool touch of the rain against my skin, I noticed that the air seemed charged with an energy I couldn't quite define. It crackled and hummed with an otherworldly intensity, as if the very fabric of reality were on the verge of unraveling. With cautious steps, 
I approached a puddle, bending down to inspect it with a mixture of fascination and trepidation. But as I reached out to touch the surface of the water, the droplets scattered like mist, evaporating into thin air before my eyes. I recoiled in shock, my hand trembling as I stared at the empty space where the water had once been. It was as if the raindrops were fleeing from me, retreating into the ether like ghosts fading into the night. Determined to unravel the mystery, I ventured further into the storm, my senses on high alert as I searched for any sign of the elusive raindrops. But no matter where I looked, they remained just out of reach, vanishing into thin air at the slightest touch. With each failed attempt, my frustration grew, mingling with a creeping sense of dread that gnawed at the edges of my mind. What force could be at work here, capable of defying the laws of nature and robbing the raindrops of their descent? Lost in my thoughts, I wandered aimlessly through the rain-soaked streets, the sound of my footsteps drowned out by the steady rhythm of the storm. But as the minutes turned into hours and the night wore on, I realized that I was no closer to uncovering the truth. Exhausted and disheartened, I finally returned home, the memory of the vanishing raindrops haunting my every step. As I lay in bed, the sound of the storm raging outside, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had stumbled upon something far beyond my understanding, something that defied explanation and challenged the very fabric of reality. And as sleep claimed me, dragging me down into the depths of dreams, I couldn't help but wonder what other mysteries lurked in the darkness, waiting to be discovered by those brave enough to seek them out. Story 49 the carnival was always a place of wonder and excitement, a world of flashing lights and colorful attractions that seemed to come alive under the glow of the neon signs. But on this particular evening, as the storm clouds gathered overhead and the first drops of rain began to fall, the atmosphere took on a decidedly eerie quality, casting a shadow over the usually festive atmosphere. Undeterred by the weather, I ventured into the heart of the carnival, drawn by a sense of curiosity and adventure. The sound of laughter and music echoed through the air, mingling with the distant rumble of thunder as I made my way through the throngs of people. As I wandered deeper into the carnival grounds, I stumbled upon a maze of mirrors tucked away in a secluded corner. Intrigued by the promise of adventure, I stepped inside the dim light casting strange shadows across the walls as I ventured deeper into the labyrinth of glass. At first, the maze seemed like nothing more than a harmless diversion of funhouse attraction designed to bewilder and confuse. But as the storm outside intensified and the rain beat against the roof with increasing ferocity, I began to realize that there was something decidedly unsettling about the maze of mirrors. The reflections seemed to warp and distort with each step I took, my own image shifting and changing in ways that defied logic and reason. It was as if the mirrors held the power of their own, a magic that warped reality and blurred the lines between illusion and truth. With each turn, the faces staring back at me grew more distorted, their eyes filled with a hunger that sent shivers down my spine. I tried to shake off the feeling of unease that settled over me like a suffocating blanket, but it clung to me like a shadow, refusing to be cast aside. As I stumbled through the twisting corridors, my heart pounding in my chest, I realized that I was hopelessly lost. Every direction I turned seemed to lead me further into the maze, deeper into the labyrinth of glass where reality and illusion merged into one. The storm raged on outside the sound of thunder echoing through the halls of the maze like a warning from some unseen force. But inside, all was silent save for the sound of my own ragged breaths and the echo of my footsteps against the cold, hard floor. I tried to retrace my steps, to find my way back to the entrance of the maze, but the mirrors seemed to shift and change with each passing moment, disorienting me further with their ever-shifting reflections. And then, just when I thought I couldn't bear it any longer, 
I stumbled upon a clearing in the maze, a small alcove tucked away in the corner, hidden from view by a curtain of shimmering glass. As I stepped inside, I felt a strange sense of calm wash over me, as if I had stumbled upon a sanctuary in the midst of chaos. The mirrors here were different, their reflections softer, more gentle, as if they were trying to guide me towards some hidden truth. With a sense of determination, I pressed on, following the path laid out before me by the mirrors. And then, finally, just when I thought I would be lost forever, I saw at the faint glow of light at the end of the corridor, beckoning me forward like a beacon in the darkness. With renewed hope, I quickened my pace, the sound of my footsteps echoing through the empty halls of the maze. And then, with a sense of relief so profound it was almost palpable, I stepped out into the open air, the storm raging on outside like a distant memory. As I emerged from the maze of mirrors, blinking in the harsh light of the carnival grounds, I couldn't help but feel a sense of gratitude for having escaped its clutches. For in that labyrinth of glass, I had learned a valuable lesson that sometimes the line between reality and illusion is thinner than we dare to imagine and that it is only by facing our fears head-on that we can hope to find our way out of the darkness and into the light. Story 50 Alone in my attic during a stormy night, I sought refuge from the tempest raging outside. The wind howled like a mournful ghost, rattling the windows and sending shivers down my spine. Seeking solace from the cacophony of the storm, I rummaged through the dusty corners of the attic searching for some forgotten treasure to occupy restless mind. It was then that I stumbled upon an old journal, its leather cover worn and weathered with age. Intrigued by the promise of hidden secrets, I dusted off the journal and settled into a cozy corner, the soft glow of a lantern casting shadows across the yellowed pages. As I flipped through its brittle pages, the rain drumming against the window seemed to grow louder drowning out all other sounds. Each droplet echoed like a drumbeat, a steady rhythm that reverberated through the attic like the heartbeat of the storm itself. The journal was filled with cryptic entries, the handwriting faded and barely legible. Words and phrases leapt off the page in a dance of ink and parchment, swirling together in a maelstrom of confusion and intrigue. But as I read on, the whispers of the rain began to take shape, forming words and phrases that echoed the journal's cryptic entries. It was as if the storm itself was speaking to me, its voice a whispered melody that danced on the edge of my consciousness. With each passing moment, the whispers grew more insistent, urging me to uncover the secrets hidden within the pages. I became lost in the labyrinth of words, my mind consumed by a hunger for knowledge that bordered on obsession. I read of lost loves and forgotten dreams, of journeys taken and paths left unexplored. The journal spoke of a life lived in the shadows, of a soul searching for meaning in a world gone mad with chaos and confusion. But amidst the darkness, there were glimmers of light, a spark of hope that refused to be extinguished, no matter how fierce the storm raged outside. It was a reminder that even in the darkest of times, there was always a flicker of hope waiting to be kindled. As the night wore on and the storm outside raged on with unabated fury, I delved deeper into the journal, my fingers tracing the faded lines of text, as if searching for some hidden truth buried within its pages. But just as I reached the final entry, the whispers ceased leaving me with a sense of dread that lingered long after the storm had passed. The last page was blank, devoid of any words or symbols a silent testament to the mysteries that remained unsolved, the secrets that lay hidden in the shadows. With a heavy heart, I closed the journal and set it aside, the weight of its revelations pressing down on me like a burden too heavy to bear. The storm had passed, but the echoes of its whispers lingered on haunting me in the quiet moments of the night when sleep eluded me and the darkness pressed in from all sides. And as I lay there, alone in the attic with nothing but the sound of my own heartbeat to keep me company, I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets lay hidden in the shadows, 
waiting to be uncovered by those brave enough to seek them out.